Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to a two-part conference series called Decolonizing Green Spaces, Intercultural Dialogues. We're really excited about this series, first of its kind, and super excited about the lineup of panel speakers that we've got today. So I want to start first by just saying a little bit about this conference series and how it came about. So myself and my colleague, um, Dr. Juliana, both work at Brunel University, although Juliana currently works for the Institute of Education, UCL, and the two of us um, found ourselves co-teaching a module on decolonizing education. And it was through that module that the two of us started to, to discuss the work we do outside of the university, our own personal histories and other areas of work that we engage in. Myself, some of you may know me and I've looked at the attendee list so there's some familiar faces. I set up a social enterprise called Dadima CIC in 2018, where the work I did from moving into the countryside was looking at how that space could be reclaimed as a safe space for minority ethnic communities. So this two-part series was launched on International Women's Day 2023. And some of you may have read our free downloadable ebook, which shines a light on women of color doing work in nature spaces. So myself and Juliana have led the content of this seminar series. And we've also been very privileged to work with one of our doctoral researchers, Michelle Lee, who's also researching decolonizing through her work as well. Now, some of the work we've been doing or some of the conversations that we've had have really shown a thirst for these dialogues to take place. And we've kept these dialogues online um, for reasons of inclusion, accessibility, and to keep the cost low. So we're really excited. There's a few housekeeping things which we'll go through in a minute. But before I do that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Juliana Ferry, who's going to say a little bit about the words decolonizing and interculturality. Thank you, Lita. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here this morning. And apologies if my voice sounds a bit strained and croaky, but um, I, have a, I have a cough at the moment. So myself, that my throat is quite sore, so apologies if my voice is not at its best this morning. I'm just going to be quite brief, really, and um, just tell you a little bit about the theoretical lens that Gita and I decided to use for this seminar series. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about interculturality and decolonial thinking. So we see interculturality as the possibility to initiate dialogue across the many barriers that prevent people from historically and systematically marginalized communities to access nature and green spaces. Intercultural dialogue for us means reaching out and building positive connections within, but also transversely outside those communities to promote inclusivity and the understanding of the many, many issues faced by minority groups. And most of all, we want to focus on the knowledge and inspirational impact stories. We believe in the power of education and in quoting the great intercultural educationalist, Jagdish Bundara, we think about the intercultural as a necessary step to enable social interactions that are based on a willingness to listen and to understand different perspectives and lived experiences. So the decolonial aspect is naturally linked to intercultural dialogue for us. In pointing at the barriers, and there are many, we also celebrate success and the empowering example of our select speakers today in engaging in dialogue and in showing different ways to engage and live in nature. So the session today will be recorded. There is a chat facility as well. Um, ideally, we'd like you to focus on the Q&A 
um, aspect of the chat facility. We would love it if you could share any reflections on Twitter, if you are on Twitter or social media, and if you could use the hashtags decolonizing green spaces, decolonizing with an S please, and if there is a woman speaking on the panel, please use the hashtag in relation to our International Women's Day ebook, International Women's Day 2023, Women of Colour in Nature. And we'll say a little bit at the end about the free downloadable ebook. So the running of the day is on the slide and it's going to commence with Dr. Anjana Gatwa, who will be delivering our keynote speech. There'll be a short comfort break after that for 10 minutes. And then we have our speakers, Maxwell, Adia, and Quezia. Now, Adia sadly has been working far too hard and lost her voice. So I will be playing Adia for that part and doing a little bit of role play. Followed by lunch, and then speakers Mohammed and Jasmine. Again, another break. And then Anjana will pull together with myself some of the summary at the end of the day of reflections, ways forward, followed by some of your questions. So I'm going to now introduce to you Dr. Anjana Gatwa. Now I came across Dr. Anjana Gatwa on social media. One of the joys of social media is meeting some really interesting people. And felt really privileged that Anjana worked with me on my social enterprise, Dadima CIC, in the countryside. And she really went over and above to, to support me, encourage me, and work with me as an earth scientist. And Jana is unique in the identity she brings to this work. <clears throat> she is an earth scientist with a difference. She brings special natural landscape stories to diverse audiences through a global lens. She is an expert geologist and fossil lover, and she's been awarded several prestigious awards for her science and award-winning diversity work. She's also currently writing her book, and I'm sure she'll say a little bit more about that later. So why did I choose Anjana? And why did Juliana, Michelle, all of us agree on Anjana being the keynote? Well, it's because her actions speak. So it's not just theoretical. What she does, her activism, her academic work, her scientific work spoke to us. So without further ado, we are really privileged to introduce our keynote speaker for this conference series. I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to Anjana. Thank you so much. That's quite an introduction. I feel quite overwhelmed by it. Um, if you could allow me to share my screen, that would be marvellous. At the moment, I cannot. Thank you everyone so much for coming this morning as well. I really do appreciate it. It's uh, I know how busy everyone is. So I'm going to share a few slides. Um, let's hope this all works and technology works. Can you see those slides, Gita? Is that is that okay? Can everybody see the slides? Yes, I can see the Brilliant. slides. Thank you. Um, I've got about 20 minutes to share with you quite a meaty subject. I've called my talk Provenance, Exploring the Origins of Colonialism in Nature. And the word provenance is actually a geological term. It's one of my favorite words actually from geology. And I'm, I've got a dictionary here, so I'm gonna define it for you in the way that geologists understand it. Provenance is the source area of sedimentary material and the nature of the rocks from which it is derived. And I'm being a bit naughty here because I'm co-opting that word to really explore the origins of why um, people of colour, uh, minoritised people feel marginalised from nature, or so it might seem. 
And I think what we're going to do today, this keynote is really about addressing some of the misconceptions that a wider society, and particularly in the conservation sector, we have about the relationship seen um, between ethnic minorities and natural green spaces. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to present you a series of examples that begins to deconstruct those assumptions that are made about us. I'd like to start off with some rocks, obviously. Why wouldn't I? This is a really beautiful picture of a lava flow in Hawaii. And with the wonders of scientific research and geochemistry, we geologists can understand the, 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 the kind of the science behind this landscape. There are two ty different types of lava here, actually. And geochemists will use all sorts of techniques to understand what the makeup of these lava flows are. The critical difference is a chemical called silica. And you've got two different types of lava flows forming here because of the silica content within the lava itself. The Pahoehoe lava, um, because this is a picture from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, and Pahoehoe is an indigenous Hawaiian term to describe this lava. You can see in the bottom right corner, it's this kind of very runny, uh, fluid, vis you know, very runny lava. And as it as it as it flows a bit like honey a bit like treacle it kind of forms this really beautiful ropey like structure and pahoy hoy actually means rope like structure so that's one type of lava that you can see in this picture now geochemists if they go out there and they have a look at the the kind of the scientific makeup of these rocks they'll also find a different type of lava that has a different chemical content called rr and again, that is a Hawaiian native Hawaiian word. And RR lava has a low, has a higher silica content, which makes it a lot more kind of uh, viscous. It, it flows a lot slower, and it and as it cools, it kind of forms this jagged texture. So, as a scientist, this is how we look at landscapes. This is how geologists break down nature. What what can it tell us about? the chemistry, the physics, um, and how does this begin to form the landscapes that we can appreciate through a scientific lens? Now, remarkably, all of these advances in our understanding of lava flows have been made, you know, in the last 50 to 80 to 100 years. But if we go back in time, let's go back to the native indigenous Hawaiians. One and a half thousand years ago, the native Hawaiians understood that lava flowed in different ways. And archaeologists have been out to Hawaii and they've surveyed petroglyphs um, that were made in these lava flows by these uh, indigenous Hawaiian communities. And what they found was that pretty much all of the petroglyphs that have been carved into the lava flows were all in Pahoehoe -hoi lava flows. So these native Hawaiians that were, that were living in the landscape had a deep understanding and a knowledge and appreciation of the rocks that surrounded them. This is way before geochemists came in and began to analyze the silica content of the lava. The native Hawaiians one and a half thousand years ago understood the rocks that they were living on and just let that sink in. The other thing that is really beautiful about this relationship that they had with the rock, not only did they understand the lava, how it flowed, what they could use it for, they had a deep spiritual connection with the landscape. And what you can see in this, this picture are these holes that have been drilled into the surface of the Pahoehoe lava. And what those holes signify are markings that connect a child that was born into that community with the land, with the rock itself. So again, let that sink in for a minute. Not only did the indigenous Hawaiians understand the lava and how it flowed and how it formed, the landscape that they lived in. They also buried the umbilical cords, cords of their newborn babies into tiny little holes that they drilled into the lava flow. They would cover it with the rock. And what that would mean was that their child would be forever bonded to the rock, to the land for their rest of their lives. And I find that a really beautiful moment that sits alongside the science that we understand that forms this landscape. It's a really beautiful way for us to see that these ancient native Hawaiians had a deep understanding of the land, the rock that they were connected to and lived in. This sense of ex 
expertise, and we'll come back, come back to this as we go through this talk, this sense of connection with the land is a universal meaning and, and understanding that bridges many different global cultures. In my own culture, I'm a Hindu and I was raised as a Hindu uh, by my family, still a practicing Hindu. We have a word that describes in our own language, what those native Hawaiians um, felt with the, the lava flows that covered Hawaii. And it's called dhati. This word is four and a half thousand years old. Isn't that incredible? And what it means is the earth. And if we extrapolate that to that wider sense of how this word is interpreted within that community, within the Hindu community, it means, it's a word that means how you ground yourself with the soil, the rock and the land that you are upon, that you are on. And for me, um, I was born in Slough and I, my parents are from East Africa, from Kenya. They came here in the 1960s. For me, I wouldn't say that Slough is my dharti. Although I was born there and my childhood was spent there, my dharti now is on the Jurassic coast. And I've put this beautiful picture of Stone Barrow behind. Uh, the word, because this is this is where I feel grounded in the rocks, the fossils and the landscape and the coastline of this beautiful place, this World Heritage Site. This for me is my dharti. And think to yourself, think to yourself where your dharti is, because I think as scientists, we often lose focus of how science makes us feel. Do we feel excited by Finding a fossil on a beach, for sure. Do we feel excited if it's a new fossil that tells us something amazing about the science that we're working in? For sure. But actually, if we dig deeper than that, we all have an emotional connection with the land that we're living in, that we're researching, and that we're trying to understand. I'm not the only one that has the rock collection in my family. A few months ago, um, I found out that my mum also collects rocks. And she has this particular rock in her temple at home. and every year every at the start of every spring my mother and I remember this freezing cold in the garden in Slough as a kid growing up we'd be dragged out into the garden and my mother would conduct a ceremony where she would worship a rock and that that place of worship in the garden freezing cold in my Salwa Kameez it was it was the beginning of spring and we would be worshipping Shitala Mataji who is uh, an incarnation of Mother Earth and this rock in my mother's temple, there are at least 21 goddesses embodied in that rock, ranging from Parvati, the goddess of the mountain, Dharti, who's Mother Earth, Shitala Matiji. Rock has always meant something to my mother. And it's, it's, it's a part of nature that for many people is quite inanimate. But for us, for me in particular, it is alive with stories and meaning and spirit. And when we look across different global cultures, you'll find that it's not just Hindus that believe in this. If you go to speak to people in the First Nations, they have a, a celestial being called Sky Mother who fell from the earth and she was integral to forming um, the planet itself. If you go to uh, South American communities, particularly those who still are practicing cultural, uh, her cultural practices from the Incans, you'll find that Mother Earth is represented through Pachamama. And then we have Gaia going all the way back to ancient Greek mythology. The concept of Mother Earth in replicating and helping communities to understand natural processes has always been there. And in fact, what's really interesting is that in that picture um, of that South American community, the community is putting food and offerings and gifts into the ground to appease Mother Earth because they're worried about earthquakes. So there's a very strong relationship that global communities have with the rock, with the land and with Earth. And what we need to do as Western scientists in the global north is we need to open our minds and understand that actually these communities have experts in their own right. This is probably one of my favourite retellings actually of connections with nature across that global landscape and this is from the Anangu people in Australia the the indigenous aboriginal people they have a law called Jukarpa and 
the Aboriginal people see the land as their ancestors, as their relatives, and they refer to Uluru as their grandfather and their grandmother. And they use the landscape to guide how they care for the land, but also for each other. And I think this is a really critical thinking that has that has almost been lost in our strive to understand the scientific meaning of the natural world. These communities that have lived in the landscape harmoniously for thousands of years, we've lost the sense of what that connection with the land means. And what I would argue is that we need to go back to these ancestral stories to talk to these indigenous communities to understand why are they so successful in connecting themselves and understanding the land more so than we are in the global north? If you haven't already read Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, I really do urge you to read it. It is the original thesis in discussing the animacy of nature. And I love this, this phrase that I've taken from her book. In Potawatomi 101, rocks are animate as are mountains and water and fire and places, beings that are imbued with spirit. I think that is the critical line there. For many of these global communities who have been subject to colonization, for thousands of years, they were connected to the land because they believed that the land had spirit and it needed nurturing and looking after. And I think that is a really critical lens through which colonization has really damaged. It's really shattered that over the last 100 to 200 years. And I think when you begin to listen to these voices from these global, global communities, particularly if you are working in a scientific or a conservation field, you'll begin to understand that actually, when we talk about words such as sustainability and regenerative agriculture or re regeneration of nature, wilding, all of this goes back to this as an origin, these thoughts, these philosophies, this is where it comes from. When we talk about the impacts of colonialism on nature, those sensibilities, those ideals, those philosophies, they were ridiculed when the white settlers traveled across the, across the world, colonizing different countries. And I've put two examples here actually about the conflict that science has brought. We have seen great progression in our thought, obviously. Um, I've put these bird skins up. This is a picture from the Natural History Museum. And these were bird skins collected by Afro Alfred Russell Wallace, local to me. He's actually buried in Broadstone, a village just up the road from me. Um, without his understanding and his work on, on the birds that he collected in the South Pacific, we wouldn't have our understanding of natural selection and evolution. But also, let's have a look at Henry de la Beach. Henry de la Beach was a man who lived, who again lived in the Southwest. He um, funded the work of Mary Anning and her work then led on to huge advances in our understanding of past life on Earth. Of, and she was a pioneer of paleontology. But the cost the cost of all of this investment into science and scientific understanding has been heavy, has been great on the communities affected most, particularly those in the global south and particularly the 8 million Africans that were taken out of the continent and put into slavery. And Henry de la Beach, I find this a particularly difficult case study because for me, Mary Anning is a huge hero. Why wouldn't she be? I, I work on the Jurassic Coast. But when I discovered about eight years ago that much of her work was funded through his proceeds that he collected from his slave plantation in Jamaica, I was riddled with conflict. And I still find that really, really difficult to resolve in myself, that advance that we made in science at the cost of human lives and human trauma. This comes back to natural spaces in, in our country, in the UK. And this is Petworth House, um, which I visited last year in Sussex. It is a beautiful space, there's no doubt. The trees are ancient. They evoke all sorts of feeling and connection with land. The, the deer park is beautiful. I walked through it, it's been landscaped by Capability Brown. But again, just like our understanding and advances made in science, these beautiful spaces often have very, very ugly histories. And if you go inside Petworth House, and many of you may have been there already, you'll walk past a portrait. This is Charles Seymour. He's the sixth Duke of Somerset. And if you look carefully at the slide, you'll see a child, an unidentified child attendant, a young black boy. 
So we know now that as we walk through the beauty of this landscape that was landscaped by Capability Brown with these ancient trees that evoke, you know, a connection to the past, we know now that it was funded through the backs of those that were enslaved and tortured and oppressed. So how do we, how do we begin to uh, resolve that conflict within ourselves, these contested histories that these beautiful places have? I'm not here to answer that question. I'm just here to pose that question to you. One of the key books that's come out in the last couple of years is Amitav Ghosh, The Nutmeg's Curse, and I really do urge you to read this. Um, and this is a book that really examines um, the impact of colonialism on conservation, on the, the propagation that we are, the situation that we're now in, in terms of global climate change. What I've also done is I've taken this snapshot of a statement from Professor Alexandre Antonelli at the Kew Gardens, uh, Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. And what he believes, because he's, uh, he's head of scientific research there, um, he believes that the imperialist view within conservation still prevails. And from his point of view, scientists continue to report how new species are discovered every year. That scientists have appropriated indigenous knowledge and downplayed its depth and complexity. And I think this is, this is a kind of pattern we see over and over again, not just in ecology, not just in biodiversity, in geology as well. And I kind of talked a little bit about that with those lava flows in Hawaii. The recognition of global cultures, particularly those from the global south, and their contribution to our understanding of conservation and science is somehow been lost because it has been less valued. What happens if those views, those understandings, that knowledge, that rich knowledge and understanding of nature, what happens when it's presented through a more palatable lens? It's far more successful and I'll come on to that in a minute, but when we look at the impact of that, of the, the impact of colonialism on nature, this is a really good example of that. This is uh, the Guntung, Gunung Kantan limestone cast in Malaysia. This is a this is a this was a limestone mountain, and literally half of it has been blown up, taken away. Limestone is crushed, it's is baked into something called calcium oxide, and then used as a byproduct um, to make cement. So this kind of extractive nature, if you like, to how we relate to nature is a product of colonialism. When Alfred Russell Wallace went to, went to places like Malaysia and collected thousands and thousands of bird skins, conservation science is almost rooted in this understanding of we must collect, we must collect and kill and bring back to our museums and bring back to our universities to, in order to understand and enhance our scientific knowledge. And when we look at rocks in the landscape, because of course I'm a geologist, I am looking at things like this, there is a similar attitude of a disconnection and a divorce from what nature is. And we almost look at it as a resource that how can we use this and enhance our own lives at the um, expense of nature itself. I want to come on to back to this kind of concept that I was on mute. I'm sorry. I think you lost me for a few minutes. I'm not sure if my yeah. internet cut out. Hopefully you can yeah. see me again. Hopefully you no can worries. also see the screen. Uh, yeah. So I want to come back onto this point about how the wheel has been reinvented. Uh, can you see my screen, Gita? I'm hoping you can. Yes, everything is Thank good. Thank you. Good. Um, there was a book that was published uh, five or six years ago, and it was a book that made huge ripples in the conservation sector about what it was proposing. So, so it was Wilding by Isabella Tree, and it was all about uh, a large estate, the Nepp estate in Sussex, and the realisation that um, industrial 
size scale farming, intensive farming was very damaging for nature. It was leading to poor soils um, and leading to a degradation of the natural environment. And the book talks very much about moving back to the principles of living in harmony with nature, about intercropping and finding that balance um, of how humans can live harmoniously with nature. And I, I took this quote from Chris Packham, actually, and he talks he, he talks, you know, very uh, proudly about this book being a salvation for conservation, that this is a new hope. And. For me, this is slightly problematic because I, I did read the book, I did enjoy it, but I found it deeply steeped in privilege. Um, of course, if you own quite a large estate in Sussex, you have the ability to manage it in a way that, that kind of suits your belief systems. Um, but I think this is a new hope. Why is it? Why is it a new hope? And I think when we go back to the originators of this practice. So here is a quote from Ade Romero Briones, um, who represents the First Nations um, Development Institute. Let's go back to the originators of these, e these ethos and these philosophies. She talks about to decolonize regenerative agriculture, we have to go back and think about the times before European settlement and contact to the times when there was more of a balance in ecological environments that we're trying to correct now. And I think that's really critical, that point. We have to go back to the times before European settlement and contact. And what she talks about is that when the white settlers came over to North America, they viewed the First Nations people, the Native Americans, as savages, and they viewed them as hunter-gatherers, that their practices, which was pretty much rooted in what Wilding is talking about, this practice of living harmoniously with nature, of respecting and understanding the needs of plants and people to live harmoniously together, of animals, to see the animacy of nature, all of that was wiped out, and it was seen as, as, a, as a kind of primitive way of living. And what I find is really interesting is how if that voice, if those ideas, if that ethos and philosophies is packaged up differently, if it's presented through a more privileged lens, preferably white, is it more acceptable to the conservation sector than, for, for example, from uh, someone who I met a couple of weeks ago whose family have owned mangrove swamps in Nigeria for generations who are desperately trying to save those mangrove swamps using age old traditions that are being handed down from family to family. Whose voice is more valuable? I think that's the question that I'd like to ask you. And when I think back to my own heritage and culture, we have, we have a law called Dharma and it is about the principles of balance through nature. And this principle is over four and a half thousand years old. So if you've read Wilding, that's great. Read it. I, I, I encourage everybody in this group to read it. But please remember that the philosophies and the ethos and the discussions in that book are based on knowledge that goes back thousands of years in global cultures, where we have always advocated for the principles of balance, through nature, creation and destruction. We live in harmony with nature. And what's really interesting is if you look at colonial history in India, in Af Africa, in First Nations communities, these principles were ridiculed, they were subjugated, and they were almost wiped out by the colonizers. And I think it's very, very important to understand where the ideals in the modern day cons conservation movement come from. I'm going to explain the origins of Dharma because it is a four and a half thousand year old story to you. And it all goes back to Dharti, which is Mother Earth. And this story, which I rediscovered when I was writing the proposal for my book, is extraordinary. There is a king and he was ravenous in terms of what he wanted to take from the earth. The earth was weak and she was ragged. And she said to the king, king stop using me stop abusing me I have nothing left to give you all of my resources are gone and the king was was he almost didn't care he was like do you know what I can take whatever I want from you because I own you and so mother earth she turned herself into a cow and she ran away 
and the people were left with nothing. There was pestilence, there was disease, and the king was horrified. And in anger, his wise sages of his kingdom, they killed him. And out of his body, they took the evil part of his spirit and they banished the Raksha, which was a demon. They banished the demon away. Um, but then they took the good spirit out and the good, good spirit became King Prithvi. And they said to the king, go search for Mother Earth. Explain to her that you are sorry, that you will make amends. And so the king went out in search of Mother Nature. He went out to search for Dharti. And when he found her, he fell to his knees and he said, I'm so sorry for what we've done to you. I'm so sorry. What can we do in order to encourage you back to save humanity? And Mother Earth said to him, you must establish the laws of nature. You must establish Dharma, which will help people on earth live in harmony with nature you must respect me and you must use me carefully i will give you the gifts that you need to to support humanity but treat me with respect and care and so dharma was born the principles of nature were born living in balance with nature was born and if you are practicing yoga or any any kind of movement like that yoga is embedded in dharma when you practice any any movement you are grounding yourself with the earth that is where concepts like wilding go back to so how do we claim our space in nature as ethnically ethnically diverse communities in fact we are experts in our own right you only need to go and talk to community leaders to find that actually we are not disconnected with nature and i would argue that my mother um, who performed that ceremony in her garden every year um, as and to me as a freezing eight-year-old we probably had a deeper connection in nature than some of the richest landowners in this country we are experts in our own right Thank you so much for listening to me. All of this content is in my forthcoming book, which is coming out in September 2025. I do apologize for the slight break um, in my talk. I think I must have accidentally pressed a button and I'll hand over to the organizers. Um, thank you, Anjana. To the next part of, of our day. And we're going to have three speakers now, Maxwell Ayamba, Dr. Adia, Adia Misra and Quezia. And um, we will take questions at the end of the lunch, uh, but feel free to use the chat in the meantime, the Q&A uh, function actually, to, to write down any thoughts, any questions that you would like to ask at the end. Um, and we'll reserve a space for that um, in the afternoon. So the way we are uh, organized this, the, the three speakers, is by asking four questions so that all three speakers will have the opportunity to talk about some of the issues um, that emerge when we think about green spaces and particular uh, decolonizing green spaces and following from uh, Dr. Anjana's um, amazing keynote before. So really set the scene for what we want to talk about. Um, so the four questions that we will ask our panelists uh, we, we like to start with the successes because we, uh, when I introduced, Brit and I introduced um, the seminar this morning, we talked about interculturality and dialogue um, and the importance of focusing on barriers, but also celebrating success. So we want to start with the successes. We want to start with um, uh, focusing on impact um, and key successes in these spaces. But then we we'll also would be talking about challenges and the barriers that, that people face um, in, in green spaces. Um, and then a third question would be around what are the resources that are needed to continue this work? And then we'll finish with a future orientated question around plans moving forward. So these are the four questions that we'll be uh, asking our panelists. And it's, it, it is really going to be a dialogue um, with, with uh, Maxwell, Adia, and Quezia. Okay, so I'm going to start with Maxwell Ayamba. I'm just going to quickly introduce Maxwell. Maxwell Ayamba is the founder and managing director of Chef Women Environmental Movement. Currently, uh, Maxwell is a PhD research student in Black Studies at the University of Nottingham. Maxwell is an environmental journalist by profession and co-founder 
of Black Men Walk for Health group, which inspired the play Black Men Walk in 2018. Maxwell is the first Black person to serve on the board of Ramblers Association UK. Welcome, Maxwell. It's a pleasure to have you today. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, uh, for having me. Um, I don't know how I'm going to follow uh, after Anjana's um, wonderful, uh, what do you call it, opening speech, um, which really inspired me. Um, well, I mean, um, I suppose um, what I want to say is um, just listening to what Anjana said um, and speaking as an ecocentrist, um, I believe um, basically what we are facing now in terms of the Anthropocene is a situation where Western Eurocentric knowledge of the environment has led us to the current crisis that we are facing as humanity. Um, even though my talk today is not going to address that per se, um, but I just want to talk about my successes in terms of what I've been doing in my area of work. Um, I call myself a pracademic, uh, which simply means a practitioner and an academic at the same time. Um, the fact that uh, in terms of what I do, Practically, is what informs theory and what I do theoretically informs practice here. Um, so the question I'm supposed to be addressing today is my successes. And before I talk about my successes, I just want to begin by saying that um, uh, recent uh, what call studies have shown that access uh, to green spaces and blue spaces, um, you know, have been beneficial for our physical and mental well-being. Um, I mean, the government uh, green social prescribing initiative, which I'm part of, um, was launched two years ago. And, and basically, uh, it's talking about the fact that, you know, access to nature is now very good as an alternative to antidepressants. And the GPs now through link workers will be signposted to uh, signpost people to green activities, which is good. Um, but then, um, I mean, our communities have already been doing this, you know, back home. Um, the close to nature, like Anja, Anjana have rightly pointed out, you know, so we know all this long, long time. It's just that we marginalized from the environment. And that's why we are where we are today. And so this form of nature medicating has proved to have positive effects for depression, anxiety, as well as improved sleep patterns, but also promote positive social interactions and even to help generate a sense of meaning in our lives. And that's what communities back home do all the time. When we are in natural environments, that's what we are. We are part of nature, that's what I call biocentrism. However, research has also evidence that marginalized groups often take face hostility and discrimination in the English countryside or in green spaces and are made to fail, though nature must be protected from us black people or minoritized people due to the lack of knowledge. And just as Anjana have explained, we don't like the knowledge, we have the knowledge and the experience. And that we are a threat to the workings of the countryside. We are not a threat to the working countryside. They just fear that there's a history of the countryside that we'll be involved in, and they don't want us there. Much of this racism is not explicit, but implicit or systemic, baked into the walls of the countryside and environmental organizations with minoritized groups facing, you know, when they see us there, then we are seen to be out of place in those spaces. And so in the culture of suspicion and exclusion, English land ownership and those who own these spaces see us as a threat and where we belong has to be in the urban areas. So basically multiculturalism is not to be seen as part of the countryside. And therefore we have these old English values which basically based on hierarchy of class and race where basically, who dates back actually to, you know, the Enclosure Acts in 1753, when land was taken away from the commoners. But we know very well that black people have been in this country for centuries, starting from the Romans, I mean, the first black Roman empire, Severus Septimus, um, the black Moors, the Tudus, the enslaved people, and, you know, we had Black soldiers who fought alongside their white counterparts in the English wars, uh, the, the, the two world wars. So we have had black presence in this country for centuries, but we've been erased completely from the landscape. So basically, that has led to a situation where seeing black faces in those spaces are seen to be out of place. 
So to change this narrative, what do we do? We need agency. And so as part of that, what I have been doing as a pracademic, in 2014, myself and two friends of mine set up what we call the 100 Black Men Work for Help group, which obviously, um, you know, you mentioned. And the idea behind the 100 Black Men Work for Help group actually was to promote, you know, the concept of all culture of working among Black men in spaces that we think we want to reclaim, which is a countryside where basically we've been written out. And the Black men working was seen as a form of protest by natural fact that shouldn't be the case. And so when Black men walking eventually led to the production of the national play Black men walking, it was seen as novel because people just can't understand why Black men should walk in the countryside. So the play written by Testament actually traces 500 years of Black British history in these landscapes, which has been erased. And this erasure has led to the present day situation where seeing black faces in those spaces is seen to be out of place. And so now through our agency in terms of the black men working, we have seen a rise in number of working groups now like Black Girls Hike, Muslim Hikers, Flock Together, Work for Health, and the number of emerging working groups taking ownership or claiming ownership of the countryside. I've, I was also involved in the first ever people of color trespass march in Edeal called the Kinder in Color Trespass. I was, in fact, um, April was exactly two years to commemorate 90 years of the Kinder Mass Trespass, where basically the working class, the white working class had to fight for access to a countryside that today we are benefiting just only 8% only of the countryside we have access to, 90%, 92% is still locked away. Much of this countryside is owned by the aristocracy, the crown, and the gentry. So just only 8% we can access. And yet accessing this 8% is still a challenge for minoritized groups. So much of the work we do is really to empower people to have access to these places. And despite the Crow Act, which is the Council of Rights Act, which was passed in 2000, like I said, we are still in a position where we have minoritized people not seen in those spaces. The environmental sector is the second least diverse sector, only second to farming in the UK. That just goes to tell you or demonstrate how least diverse that sector is. So what efforts can we do really to deconstruct the environmental sector, to decolonize the environmental sector, to make it more equitable, to make it more accessible. We are living, like I said, in times of the Anthropocene, the climate crisis are here. R climate environment is not a white or black issue. It's nothing to do with race. We are all in this together. How can we fashion new narratives that we can work together? Where basically green is not seen as white, but seen as diverse and inclusive. Embracing diversity, embracing difference, promoting the welfare of the marginalized to ensure that we have a better environment for all of us. I think that is the challenge. And COVID-19, the pandemic that happened, has demonstrated how access to green spaces are quite important for our health and well-being. And we saw how minoritized people who were disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So we are living in times where basically if we have to continue to pursue the Eurocentric way of seeing the environment, then we are heading towards the crisis, which already we are seeing in terms of what's happening globally. So these are some of the, um, what do you call it, um, um, initiatives that I'm undertaking in terms of empowering communities in the grassroots to be part of this whole social transformation in the environmental sector, where basically for years now, we've been marginalized because we are not seen as having anything to contribute to make the environment a better place for all of us. Right, you want me to move on to the next question? Sorry, thank you, Maxwell. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so now thank you for, for sharing the context, it's, it's very helpful. Um, so now in terms of specific challenges, what are some of the unique barriers you think that you've encountered or you or the communities that you serve that you've encountered? Um, so, you know, you can think about a personal lens or a community lens, but just um, some of the unique barriers, please. Well, I suppose um, these barriers, a lot of people talk about, you know, financial barriers, but basically I talk about the social and cultural and the forms of knowledge these are quite fundamental in communities that having got that privilege to navigate a system that historically have been colonized in the white Eurocentric way of doing things. So you look at the legacies of colonialism, which has led to a British countryside being whitewashed with the history of black and colored people erased from it, like I said earlier. On. So we have things like the rural idol, which was a myth created by the English ruling property owning classes as they enclosed lands displacing rural, you know, working classes. Like I said about the working class behold led to the mass trespass in 1932 into urban centers. And then you have issues to do with the National Trust, again, um, where basically properties of the National Trust are linked to enslaved people. These are all stories that are not told. And when Cora Fowler wrote her book about the green unpleasant land, it really was seen as woke. And so it was, this whole culture wars became something that we don't have a right to talk about our history or the past. And yet we know this country has got a lot of black history in it. So we have challenges in terms of how do we deconstruct this old narrative that have been handed down, a history that is always one way, a history that has not been challenged. And if you read Gus Rochelle's book, Who Owns England? If you read Nikkei's book, The Book of Trespass, Crossing the Land of Devices, if you read Quentin Fowler's book again, like I said, there's a lot here that we need to uncover, to understand why we are where we are today in terms of the challenges we face. So you look at the whole environmental sector, the staff, volunteers, the boards, they're all white. And so where green becomes white, then the cultural politics of how we deconstruct those spaces become, it remains a challenge. Then we have gatekeeping within this, this um, within the environmental sector where people are not interested to change their old way of thinking. They don't wanna move forward. They don't wanna welcome new audiences. They see them as a threat. In actual fact, that shouldn't be the case. And it's the same thing in the academia, where basically you have minoritized people not given opportunities really to advance and develop and contribute knowledge that can transform society that we purport to do. So although we have the Julian Glover review of the designated landscapes, which basically critiqued the way that especially national parks and areas of standard beauty are managed and governed, it's still a long way to go to see how these institutions, which have historically operated along, along the lines of whiteness, can decolonize their way of thinking and doing things. These are some of the challenges we continue to face on a daily basis. Therefore, there still exists this notion that where white is embedded within the social constructs or whiteness is embedded within the social constructs of management and stewardship of the environment, then the challenges to make the environmental sector or field equal will forever remain. So these challenges constitute another problem in terms of how do minoritized people who are not seen to have nothing to contribute really can have that agency and leverage to ensure that we can bring about a change for communities that we work in 
to understand that we are champions, we are ambassadors, we are mentors, that they can look up to us as the environment sector being a place that they can also want to be in. Without us being visible in these spaces, what we are directly telling our people is that these are no spaces of, for us. And yet I know the environmental sector is crying to diversify, to bring about those changes that it's interested in. But these historical barriers that I've just mentioned still remain because there are people who don't want to change for fear of giving away power. So it's all around the whole issue of power. I think Maxwell, if, um, gatekeeping, you mentioned gatekeeping. Uh, that seems to be definitely a great barrier um, in terms of um, protecting those spaces. Um, and you, you mentioned whiteness. So all the, these are key words, I think, for us to think about gatekeeping and whiteness. But also, what well, I found striking in what you just said is your reference to history. And I think, you know, as educationalists, Peter and I work in education, it's very striking to me how important it is actually to ensure that the history curriculum in schools is reflective of this diversity um, in terms of black presence in British history, for example, that you mentioned, and how important it is to teach that in schools because it starts at a young age, doesn't it? And I think education is actually, and intercultural education is a very important aspect of what, what you, you were talking about. I don't know if Gita wants to add anything. Yeah, um, and Maxwell, we've spoken about this before, about not, not shying away from sharing history. We're not saying we are our history. We, we are a lot more than our traumas, I always say. Um, but we we have to we have to unveil and unravel and speak the truth as well because the truth will all only be evident in the present when we really know what's happened in some of these some of the histories for the people who are oppressed, traumatized, um, systemically marginalized, etc. So I think Juliana, you're going to move on. Yes, to... I'm going to move on now, Maxwell. Um, so the, 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 the other question was following up from the challenges is what is it that you, the people and communities you serve and work with, need from funding bodies and nature organizations to make more of a difference or impact in the spaces where you operate and try to make a difference? So a sort of practical question here for what do you need? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I think um, before answering that question, actually, like I said earlier on, um, I know funding obviously is is fundamental. Um, because with the funding, I mean, the whole the whole natural discourse in this country is commodified. If you have no gun money, you don't get involved in anything, and that's why I didn't mention the funds of knowledge, the social and cultural capital. But that said, I think we also need to empower people in our communities in terms of the knowledge base that they need to help navigate the system. You could have all the funding, but if people are not empowered, it could be a challenge really. And the education you mentioned is quite fundamental. And that's what I want to talk about here. Because as a practitioner and as an academic in black studies, um, which is part of a wider movement for decolonial knowledge, you know, I'm using this as an emerging area of scholarship and also I also lie on things around critical race theory. Um, if you've read Kimberly Crenshaw and Derek Bell, as well as uh, Richard Delgado, basically critical race theory is what I look to use in that lens to see how best we can help transform social injustice and also anti-racism policies that we see every day, which have been implemented that have con continuously acted as barriers really to bring about the transformation, the change we want to see in society. So this involves the fact that black communities involvement in the environmental discourse cannot be done on a tokenistic basis or just in, in terms of gestures, right? Along the lines of race blind policies, which as I said, which have always been perpetuated. It means making meaningful links with communities of practice. That's what I'm interested in, that's what I'm doing by challenging some of the key assumptions that environmental organizations 
have about black people. And in one way of doing this is by broadening what we mean by knowledge, knowledge in relation to what minoritized communities want in terms of, in terms from the Western constructions of the environment. Because like Anjana rightly pointed out, we are fed with the Western constructions of the environment. And we know very well that we have come from cultures where we understand the environment, what it is. But if we have been culturally severed from our roots and found ourselves in spaces where basically our knowledge is not valued, then how do we help bring about the transformation that we want to see in society? So that education is quite fundamental, it's quite important. And therefore the most fundamental framing of knowledge that black studies offers is to demonstrate how race is so woven into the fabric of both the socio-environmental you know, process that we are facing because much of the environmental problems that our people face is socioeconomic really. They are all, they are, inter they are intertwined, they are linked together. So black studies is based on knowledge produced in the struggle for liberation. And if you've read figures like Claudia Jones and others, they, they feel black studies is a root or a scholarship that we can use to decolonize and democratize areas that we struggle in and the environmental sector is one of the place, one of the er those areas. So it's important that in black studies we challenge the Eurocentric way of knowledge production of about the natural environment, like Anjana said. So nature, to me, in Western societies, is been depicted and historized as whiteness, which is wrong, really, because nature knows no race. And if you look at like Anjana rightly said, if you want to look at human and the non-human, it's all along the lines of spiritualism or spiritual. And this is something that in Western societies, you don't hear about spiritualism at all. And so therefore, this is where we stand the challenge in terms of this dominant white culture that tries to shape environmental issues using the media and other forms of controls to buy into that rhetoric is something that we have to challenge because we all need to work together collectively. It doesn't matter, race is irrelevant here because it's a, race is a social construct to look at how we can deconstruct the whole notion of environment and make it more inclusive, more diverse. Because when we talk about biodiversity, it means you know the diversity of different species. So why can't we talk about human diversity to, to you know, in order to deconstruct the environment and make it a more, um, what do you call it, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, suitable or maybe a conducive in, uh, place for everyone? Thank you, Maxwell. Sorry, I just, um, because we are, we, we are running out of time. Uh, I just uh, wanted to move on to the next question, if you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to say, actually, you know, it, it is very powerful uh, what you just said about knowledge and the fact that nature knows no race. Um, and about human diversity, but also including the non-human in how we think about nature. I think this is actually very, very powerful. Um, and, and also your focus on education is, is very powerful. And it just reminded me that Gita and I actually started this conversation that led to the seminar when we were teaching on a decolonizing the curriculum module for yeah. teachers. And we used black feminism, critical race theory, it's very embedded in what we did. Um, so I, I'm glad, you know, there is like a, a red thread around. Um, and so thank you so much for connecting to, to what we're doing so well. And so in, a, in such a powerful way. I'm just going to move on to the next question now so that we can then um, speak with the other panelists. And this is the future oriented question. So what are your plans to move forward in the work that you do? What are your hopes for the future? Well, I suppose, um... My hope for the future is to see the environmental sector becoming more diverse. Like I said earlier on, I know there's a lot of work going on there, but it's a question of how the environmental sector is prepared to listen than to, be talk than to continue to practice along the lines of tokenism, really. It's not a question of just having black figures like myself and others as math pieces for the sector, no. We want to see a more holistic approach to the way the environmental sector can be deconstructed and diversified. We want to have more voices. We want to, we want to see 
environmental sector are willing to listen to minoritized communities. We want to see the environmental sector changing its way of doing things in terms of organizational culture. We want to see more minoritized people within the sector. And to me, this is the challenge, and that's my, 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 my uh, motive going forward. How do we work collectively within the, the whole environmental realm or discourse to ensure that voices that have been marginalized historically can be allowed into that space, not only allowed into that space, but how are they treated in that space? Because one thing is allowing people into that space. The second thing is how people are treated in, within that space. And if you read Only Love Fresh to your production of space, you find out how spaces really can be welcoming, others can be threatening. And it is not a question of just opening, allowing people in, it's just how people can be supported to feel that have that sense of belonging to that space in order to ensure that whatever decisions that we want to do to bring about the transformation of lives in communities, social societies, especially in our communities where health and well-being, mental health, air pollution, all those kind of things are quite important. How do we work to support those communities to be able to have a better quality of life? So it's not only a question of the money alone, which obviously is important, but it's a question of respect. It's a question of treating people with dignity. It's a question of acknowledging the values of people as human beings and what they bring on board. I think that is, that is what I am interested in. That's what I'm working at. Valuing people, valuing different difference, embracing difference, acknowledging difference, having that kind of biocentric way of looking at nature holistically. That is, that's what I'm doing. And so much of my work I do is to empower communities to be able, through, my, through the knowledge I've got, not only just working with them, but also listening to them because they have a lot I have to learn from. But how do I get what I learn from to help influence policy at the top level? So that's what I'm interested in. And that's why I call, I use the word pracademic, which basically doesn't mean that knowledge just comes from me, they say. But basically, the knowledge I get from the grassroots is what I can use really to transform policies. And whatever, because much of the policies that are done, our people are marginalized. They don't have access to those policies. And some of the policies are so technical, they are not able to communicate. People can't understand those things. And it's normally preaching to the com already converted or the privileged. It is how we make information more accessible, more communicable, more discernible to people who historically have been marginalized as the other. I think that is the challenge I have. And that's what I'm interested in, in working in all spheres of life, really, where we can challenge the way historically knowledge has been communicated or has been used as a tool of power to oppress other people. So challenging that kind of way of doing things is exactly what I'm passionate about. And that's why being involved in a seminar like this or a conference like this, to me, I see as very fundamental and important because it serves as a platform or as a forum really to bring to light some of the issues that we work in communities and to also to, to, to act as advocates on behalf of people who have been marginalized to understand that they are human and they have a role to play. But we as advocates on behalf of them will have to ensure that we don't let them down. And so through seminars like this, we learn a lot from each other. And through that, we can then take that knowledge back and see how we can help transform lives and societies. Thank you, Max. That's the legacy, that was, that's the legacy I, I want to leave behind, yeah. That was very well said. Thank you, Maxwell. And Peter, is there anything you want to yeah. say? Um, there's just so much, Maxwell. And your work has been a huge inspiration in my journey, um, setting up a social enterprise as an academic. And I think my academic work has taken on a different realm a different identity since I started working at grassroots level with communities. It informs the theory and I develop theory from the grassroots work. Um, I, I really, you use the word respect and dignity 
And they are two things, Maxwell, that are embedded in everything you've done from day one. It's the respect, the dignity, that genuine embeddedness in the communities that you serve. And I think that's what's really powerful about your work. And, and Maxwell, actually, um, I think your, your words have sparked quite a few questions in our Q&A, some interesting questions that we will share at the end of the Q&A dedicated session. But um, clearly, it, it, your words have sparked uh, thinking. Um, and particularly, people are asking for um, more practical ways to, to support what you do. So um, we'll be sharing those at the end in the afternoon. But thank you so much, Maxwell. And we're going to move on now to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Adia Misra. <coughs> Hello, Adia. So uh, Adia is the founder of People's the uh, now needs to be in the main screen. Yeah, um, the, the, oh, yeah, yeah, that is not speaking. Oh, right. It's one second, just please. one second. All right, sorry, yeah, yeah, we're here now. Uh, um, Adia. Adia is the founder of Color, uh, sorry, is the founder of People of Color Paddle. This group aims to normalize the presence of uh, people of color in public sport and with a broader goal to connect people to nature. In discussing those structures that exclude underrepresented groups in taking up the sport, Adia defines her role as decolonizing public sport and promoting the image of public sport as one of immersion in nature via water. Now, um, Adia has um, uh, and lost her voice, unfortunately, so she's not able to speak today, but she has sent very kindly her intervention that Gita will be reading out, but we can see you, Adia, so you're here with us. <laughs> if you want to say anything, please feel free, but understand that you're yeah. not able to speak, so maybe you can use the chat if there's anything you'd like to add. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Adia. Okay, so now Gita, you are Adia. Yes, I am so, Adia today. So the four questions will be the same as the ones from Maxwell. Set the context first. To, um, yeah, and so Gita is going to set the context okay. first. So what a privilege to be Adia today. Um, so I'm going to set the context a little bit, just as Maxwell did. So speaking on behalf of Adia, I founded a voluntary organisation called People of Colour Paddle last year to create opportunities for people of colour across the UK to take part in paddle sport, make it part of their lives and to essentially normalize participation of people of color in this sport. The broader objective of the organization is to foster a nature connection. I started kayaking around 10 years ago and fell in love with it despite not being athletic, not being a strong swimmer, not having any spare cash. There, that's, there's a really important trio there. I remember my family being very perplexed. Why was I doing this new activity? My love for the sport grew and it became the only constant in my ever evolving life. I absolutely loved being good at something physical as I'd never been athletic and I started to learn about our outside world more. I have learned so much about birds, rocks, water, flowers, and trees whilst paddling. After a few years of paddling, I started leading groups on the water and eventually qualified as a coach to help others progress in the sport. I always feel like I don't quite fit in, whether it was the chatter, the social side, the lack of spare cash, the lack of desire to conquer, and in turn, difficulties with people trusting me as a leader. I never really thought about being the only brown face on the waterways until I got involved in initiatives to increase diversity in paddle sport. Going back to pre-pandemic pre days, and unfortunately even today, the focus of all diversity efforts in our sport tends to be about increasing numbers of women and girls which benefit a specific demographic more than others. 
I started People of Colour Paddle as a volunteer because I felt it necessary to do this work. We want to remove as many barriers as possible so people feel like they can attempt paddle sport in the UK somewhere accessible by public transport and make it part of their life without having to spend a lot of money. As a paddle sport coach, I want to be able to share my knowledge and skills of the water safely. Injury prevention and sports performance with people of colour who may not be able to access coaching from a commercial provider. I want to be clear, my aim is not necessarily for people to professionalise, but to find a nice activity that can help them feel connected, grounded, healthy and relaxed. Current efforts to improve diversity in the outdoors and sport targeting of people of home can often feel like an attempt to increase professional sports people. I think that's great for anyone who wants to do that, but that cannot be the only route to diversify the outdoors, as many of us desperately need a hobby to switch off from the stresses of life. I resonate with so much of what Adia has kindly provided with us there. I was never athletic at school, um, other than being able to do the 100 meter sprint really well. Um, I, water scared me. And I remember my daughter when she was a trainee GP in Jersey, Adia, and her very first time paddle, paddle boarding in Jersey and how nervous she was compared to her white friends paddle boarding. And after one session with a coach, I said, would you do it again? And she said, no. Um, but I think with a coach like you, she probably would have done. Um, and I'm super excited. Maybe at Brunel, we will have a few of us come. <laughs> Juliana smiling at me. And Michelle, we will join you. Okay. Hey, something. Over to Juliana again. Okay, thank you. So um, as, as I said earlier, we have four questions that we ask all panelists. So the first one is based around successes because we want to focus on the empowering example that you bring today. So um, we know there are systemic and structural barriers, but first of all, um, we want to think about your impact and your successes. Would you like to share yeah. those with us? So someone recently said to me that the mere existence of my organization challenges the structures of hierarchy and power imbalance. It does. I didn't know of any other organization where the focus is on people of color paddling until I came across Adia's work. I'd never thought of that when I started. And to be fair, I had no idea what I was doing when I first launched People of Colour Paddle. From challenging conversations about access to waterways to extremely challenging conversations around representation, we have been very busy as an organisation. It's led to people approaching us for a lot of unpaid consultancy work which is challenging to deal with. And on that point, I follow Adia on social media and I encourage you to. Um, what Adia is not afraid of or shy of is calling out. And it takes me, some of the threads that you've um, started on Twitter really make me think of Bell Hooks's work, Adia, when you do that. So that really kind of empowers me. Another point that Adia raises is our biggest success as a community organization is that the community is showing up in huge numbers. I love watching Adia's videos at night. I always log on to her account. Despite being really scared of the water, despite not swimming, despite not having good weather and ending the paddling session with big smiles. Another success, it's been so powerful for us to be able to speak freely even when we don't know each other well, about the importance of representation in the outdoors and the role we play in changing the traditional narratives. And we've already been he hearing about that this morning. I have never, I'd never truly reflected on the importance of creating safe spaces for people of color in the UK before. That's a really interesting point. We do so much every day to mask 
how we feel, assimilate as much as we can, and we try to toe the line. It is hugely beneficial for our well being to have a place where we can be ourselves authentically and freely. Gosh, my soul is vibrating with that. Well, as a non swimmer, it's making me want to do other sports. <laughs> Thank you. You may find a little Brunel University consortium coming down. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So very powerful words. Um, and, you know, I love this thread emerging around the importance to, to, to think about difference. And also gatekeeping keeps, keeps coming up. Yeah. You know, this gatekeeping is a deal of hegemonic whiteness and gatekeeping. Um, and, and, and the importance of education and representation. So all those things keep popping out, yeah. I think giving us a lot to think about. Um, so just want to move on now to, um, and something that we've already talked about and mentioned, but the challenges, the unique barriers encountered um, yeah. during this work. So Adia raises three key challenges. The first one, paddle sport is, and always has been a very niche and expensive sport. So our biggest challenge is money, power imbalance, and the unfortunate fact that a certain demographic always has more money than others, and it's not really people of colour. Challenge number two is organisational. When I started People of Colour Paddle, I wanted to help small providers across the country attract more people to the sport, while I provided overarching mentoring, support, courses for those starting out. It didn't go very well because we received responses like, you can do this on Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, or we can't make space for new, any new people. So I had to take it upon myself to expand an organization and deliver the sessions nationwide. This is a huge responsibility for a voluntary organization and it puts pressure on me. I spent the last six months applying for grants, stumbling through barriers, somehow getting to a stage where I can deliver the sessions alone. I'm worried that I won't have time to achieve the real goal of the organization. If I keep providing single opportunities to people, if I keep providing single opportunities to people and not help them progress, really important points raised there. And I visualize the burnout that leaders like Adia and others are facing when I have conversations with people doing this work. The last challenge that I want to talk about is the unique government structure in our sport. As most inland waterways are licensed, we have to find a way to work with our governing body or the waterways owners, which is very challenging, as these organisations continue to receive large sums of taxpayers' money in the name of, wait for it, inclusion, but do little or no work specifically for people of colour. Yeah, this, this is very, very important. Thank you for um, adding this idea to the challenges because uh, the tokenistic nature of EDI policies uh, means that, um, you know, the words are there, but the actions are not and the funding. So I think this is actually a crucial point to highlight and thank you for adding it. Um, and I think we could have a whole conference around EDI and tokenistic nature of inclusion policies and how if they're not followed up by real action and money, uh, financial support, then it means very little. And also changing the nature of gatekeeping as well and discourses around whiteness. But thank you so much. Now, the next question is, what do you need? So uh, I think we can guess the answer, yeah. but um, what is it that you, the people and communities you serve and work with need from funding bodies and nature organizations? Back to them, what they call it. So funding organizations need to work with community organizations and understand how their systems are creating additional barriers for people of color. I say work specifically, because while we are navigating systems, we are being a little traumatized, yes, um, and others have raised that. So it feels unfair that we should be expected to provide feedback 
on how to improve for free. And I really resonate here with Adia, what she's saying here. And one of the reasons that I've been on the brink of burnout myself are the number of requests that I've had to have free chats and free discussions on, so what can we do? And um, yeah, it, and it leads to burnout, for people who are trying to do the work. Another, what do you need? is it took me 10 months to set up as a sports club with an organizational bank account. Voluntary organizations who aren't interested in handling money, very few options. There are subliminal hints to become a commercial provider in paddle sport. There is absolutely no support for a new organization working in the space with tasks like taxes, applying for grants, navigating conversations around sponsorship and insurance. And the third one is I desperately need powerful organizations to engage in structural change. And it's the point that Maxwell raised at the end of his talk. For example, changing the composition of the board of directors so that it is more representative of society and thinking about processes of dispensing funding and how this impacts community groups. At the end of the day, community groups are doing the work that should be done by larger organizations with more resources. So they should consider who is doing the labor and who reaps the rewards. Really powerful. Well, I don't think it could have been said in a better way. So um, there's not much to add. And I think this idea of uh, having to work for free for organizations who will then reap the rewards is, is the key message here, isn't it? And the fact that actually what is needed is that people from a diverse representation are in powerful positions in these organizations. And again, we have to get keeping that way. Yeah. Um, I think what Adia has done, and you know, obviously she doesn't have her voice at the moment, and you know, I am her voice, is She's raised some really bold and specific points here um, in, the, in the conversation that she's presented. And we see this on social media constantly, that boards want to diversify um, and reflect society, but it's the same old conversation happening again and again and again. And we're in 2023 and we are in some boards where there is no diversity at all. Um, so all I can say is I'm excited about taking Juliana to a trip with Adia. Um, and the work you do is incredible, Adia. It's very niche, incredibly niche. Um, and your future orientated question, um, I'm just having a look. So there is the last question yeah. now before we move to Quasia. And what are your plans to move forward in the nature work that you do? What are your hopes for the future? And it's really simple, but it's really important. For the future, I want to see more of us out there reclaiming the water. And although that scares me, Adia, that's something I would love to do. Yeah. And I'd love to be part of what you're doing and what you've created. Um, and you've sown the seed, what you were saying is it takes me to the eco-feminist, the Indian eco-feminist Vandana Shiva and what she talks about seeds of change. You are an incredibly powerful seed of change in the work you do, incredibly powerful. Thank so you. thank you, Adia, um, for such a powerful um, talk there. I'm going to remove the spotlight. And we are going now to Quasia. Yeah. So I'm um, now going to Quesia. Yes, let's go to turn the spotlight. Okay, we can see you now, Quesia. Right. Now, last but not least, we have Quesia. We are very excited to have you, Quesia. Thank you for being here today. I'm just going to give a very quick introduction. Uh, Quesia grew up in Deckford, Southeast London. Uh, Quasia had a life-changing experience when she took part in a British Exploring Societies expedition to the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. This experience led 
to the setup of City Girl in Nature as a way to give back to the community in London and share her belief that everyone should have access to the healing beauty of nature. So, Kwesi, thank you for being here today. Now, before I start with the four questions that we ask our panelists today, would you like to just give um, uh, a little of a background of what you do, how you started, and uh, set the context for your work a little? Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me, um, guys. And it's been really interesting hearing the other speakers um, today. So thank you all. So yeah, my name is Kosia. Um, I'm from Deptford in South London. I grew up, I'm half Pakistani, half Jamaican, so I'm mixed heritage. Um, I've loved hearing a lot about like the history um, on, from both kind of those backgrounds from, for instance, Maxwell speaking about Black and obviously um, Anjana speaking about in Asia and South Asia. So uh, I can closely relate to both of those things, but we're all essentially in the same kind of category in terms of people of colour. Um, yeah, so um, I grew up with a lot of different challenges um, that I will touch on when we get to the challenges part. Um, and um, yeah, I didn't, I wasn't outdoorsy at all growing up. I think the closest to outdoors I'd I'd kind of engage in was playing football. Um, I have a football kind of background in sports. Um, I didn't really know that outdoors was a thing. Um, I knew people camped and stuff. I didn't know there was like conservationists and people that studied these types of things. I had no clue about this type of world. Um, didn't know about national parks. Didn't know about any of these spaces and places. So yeah, I come from a very different background. Um, and yeah, so after my experience in 2018, going to the Peruvian Amazon, I returned back to uh, London, wanting to have a, I had a fresh drive of giving back to people, um, which I carried on doing what I usually was doing, which was football coaching, which was working with young people um, until I attended and spoke at a conference called the Adventure Man Conference. And that's when I realized that there's a whole world out there that I didn't know about and decided I should use my own personal experience to give back um, to my community, making it real and relatable. And I kind of set up an online series and stuff. But I'll speak about more of that throughout the questions that will be asked. So I hope that gives a bit. Yes, thank you for setting the context. We are very excited to have you today, actually, because you, you present such an interesting angle. Um, you know, I'm assuming you are quite young as well, um, like you, and uh, you have this exciting experience um, in the Peruvian Amazon forest. So you, you've achieved so much at such a young age, and you, you bring a very, very unique perspective. So we are excited. Um, right. So in terms of the first question, then, we want to celebrate success, and you have many to celebrate. Um, so um, tell us about some of your successes, your impact in the space, some of the things that you've done and that you are doing now to make a difference. Um, for me, my biggest success um, and the driving force behind my work is the work that I do on the ground. Um, I'd say, um, I'll just give you a quick example. When I, so last summer, we went for a camp um with some young people that I work with regularly weekly and um there's a young person in sessions he's often not that engaged he's he likes to like get distracted a bit like me when I was younger and uh but when we actually went on a camp he had gone on a camp a year before for the first time and this was his second time going on a camp away from London and we were doing moth catching um and he was super excited and when he was collecting all the moths and stuff he was calling out to me could see a look could see a look I've got another one I've got another one and um just those those kind of experiences and being able to witness that um is just something that um honestly drives the work that I do and makes me want to keep going and creating more kind of stories like this where young people get those experiences and find a different type of interest in getting outdoors and being able to 
be a child as well because a lot of the time people from my communities often because of the challenges don't get that opportunity to just um, be themselves and embrace the natural world around them so I'd say that was my first one um, in terms of my my biggest kind of achievements and things that are um, um, I'm, if I look at I've got some notes here so um, the other one I'd say is like people that I've worked with um, that I wouldn't have thought I'd ever work with um, for instance I've done some work um, with the Natural History Museum speaking at some of their events and mm-hmm. also um, I'll touch on my online series but I'm releasing a second online series them helping sponsor this one for instance, um, as well as Thames Water, also working with Campaign for National Parks, being able to um, be one of the bursary holders and being able to share first-hand experiences of other people from the city and them actually for the first time going to a national park and sharing their experience and what it meant to them, as well as me being able to only recently know a, a national park is being able to go to um South Downs National Park which I actually created a video which is actually on my YouTube too which um kind of demonstrates that and then my third one is my online series so my online series is kind of where I started in terms of people knowing who I am and what I want to do and what I'm doing um in in terms of I do workshops I do walks and I do I make videos and create online content and my online series is all about um, getting inner city people to connect with the natural world around them you can check that out on my YouTube um, it's like my version of David Attenborough I always had like a secret kind of passion when I was younger um, David Attenborough shows which actually sparked my kind of um, my interest when I came across that opportunity to go to the Peruvian Amazon um, and yeah, my online series features different types of people and touches on different types of things from foraging to um, to nature indoors to grounding and different types of things of ways that we can connect with our natural world. And just making it real and raw, real and raw is a lot is, is a lot of what I like to do as well to make it realistic and for people to relate to my stuff, people from my community especially. But funny enough, I've had a lot of interest from people that aren't from my community because they seem to like my videos and think they're quite cool. Because maybe because I show Jordan trainers and not but just. Yeah, um, I knew you were going to be amazing, but this is exceeding my expectations. Um, and. Uh, I can see you the, being the next David Attenborough. Definitely. <laughs> I, my mind is on it. You are the next David Attenborough. Actually, in, in order to disseminate your work, when you have time, can you add in the Q&A the links to your videos and your YouTube channel so that yeah. people can, yeah. can follow you? Yeah, if they don't know your work already mm-hmm. after we finish, just put them in the Q&A so that people can, can follow you and watch your videos because I'm sure they are great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and also, I like the way you talk about education, because to me, what you do is educating people. And education is not just what happens in schools, in the classroom, but also in the community. So you are doing great work in the community to educate young people um, to be in nature. So that links now to the next question, the challenges. So what are the barriers that you've encountered uh, in the work that you do? So um, some of the challenges, I'll say some personal ones as well as social, like socially. So some of my personal challenges. um, So prior to me having that amazing opportunity to go to the Peruvian Amazon, as I mentioned, I'm of mixed heritage. So on my Pakistani side, um, I grew up as uh, helping my mom be a young carer to my grandmother who had Parkinson's disease, um, which I sadly then lost her. And then also um, at the in at the age of around 14 I lost my um, auntie who was murdered by my uncle which is seen as an honor killing um, and then a couple years after that I had lost my friend to knife crime which is not things all of which I share with you is not things that are uncommon for people for my communities to face generally especially at young tender ages I was like 17 at the time when I experienced all of this as well as then being homeless because of my uh, mental health and 
not being in the best state of mind. And these are all things, as I say, that are not uncommon for people in my community to experience from such young ages. Um, so these challenges that I face is also similar to a lot of people from my background and they're in terms of personal challenges. But socially, that then kind of um, then has this kind of mentality of normalising these types of things too, where it's normal to know someone that's been stabbed or someone that's in prison or someone that has been excluded from school and now is in prison, that prison to, um, exclusion to prison pipeline. Um, these are a lot of the challenges that I'd say um, personally and socially, as well as um, for me also is funding. Funding is a big one. Um, I feel like funding, I self-funded myself to create my online series, which I had to go into my savings to create, um, which um, in fact turned out to be a good idea that a lot impacted a lot of people. Um, if there was much more funding and kind of being given to people that are not like the norm or people that generally know how to access these opportunities, I feel that that would impact much more on um, a lot of people that may not even know they have this type of interest or kind of thing, um, as well as support in doing these funding kind of applications. A lot of the time, the language and the way that they are is not really caters to the everyone and there's different type of learner types and people that are from different type of backgrounds so I think it's important that these types of things there's like more support in these in these types of things like the funding as well as opportunities as well um, opportunities I'd say one of the biggest things that I've noticed is a lot of the time these types of things are there and available but not a lot of the time people understand that you have to kind of go to where people are already and instead of expecting people to come to you, um, if that makes sense. Um, a lot of the time people are, especially from my community, um, in their own bubble in a way. So like they're, that's where, where they're comfortable and they feel safe. So a lot of the time they don't necessarily feel that they um, want to come out of that space to then um, engage with places that they don't feel safe or welcome. So I'd say that's um, some of the biggest challenges um, and just that inviting, feeling invited and welcome in these spaces because that can often feel um, threatening and with like institutional racism and stuff like that where people aren't feeling that that is a space or place for them. I think it's important that we are, we all recognize our privileges and stuff like that and enable more people to be able to come into these spaces and places. Crazy, I have to say, you know, your words are very moving, the way you've been so open with us. Thank you for sharing. It's a very powerful story, the one you're telling. And, you know, you say that, your, you know, the community where you are is, is in a bubble, but I actually think that the bubble is the powerful community refusing, you know, to engage with difference. So, that is the bubble, I think, you know. We go back to gatekeeping. They've created a bubble where certain voices are invisible and excluded. Um, so I think it's important what you say about funding and having representation in these spaces, in the powerful spaces, because that is the bubble, you know, the powerful spaces. There are excluding voices the powerful voices like yours. So, um, and you've outlined this so well and so powerfully. I don't know if Peter wants yeah. to add anything. I think <clears throat> the other thing that you've, I mean, Quezia, honestly, I think my motherly instinct is here to feel just so proud of you at the moment. I feel very emotional. You've took, raised a really nuanced point. It's not just about the securing the funding. We know the language of these funding applications is complex. And it's something I'm raising behind the scenes, but it's also once you've got the funding, how are you supported to deliver? We know the way that outcomes work, impact, how you've got to document what you've done efficiently and effectively. Um, you, you know, the support is needed during that funding journey as well. There's mentorship is needed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are some of us here in privileged positions because although we are, people of colour or minoritised communities in the UK, we have that dual lens of academia and community-based. 
just like Maxwell does, like I do, um, and Anjana does. So I think you're, what you're saying, you're raising points about effective mentorship. Funding needs to also be put into mentorship programs to help you be, to ensure that there is success at the end. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I feel that also like with young, a lot of young people um, and people from my community, um, we do lack support sometimes. Um, a lot of the time we're like doing things for ourselves, by ourselves, and that's just, as I say, normalised. It's not something abnormal to be in that type of position. And a lot of us are actually <laughs> intelligent, but at the same time, um, our academic side has been in a way demoralized through our experiences in school where we're seen as bad kids and stuff like that. I can speak from my personal point of um of being excluded a lot of the time and stuff like that. So it it does create um self-fulfilling prophecies within a lot of people and young people from my community where we do need that support and that encouragement and that self-esteem. We have the resilience because of our life experiences, but just yeah. activating that kind of an understanding and overstanding all of these types of things is something that I'd say is something that needs to be more um you know with that support of people like me essentially well you are a brilliant young woman Gracia so yeah well you and the point you raised there about intelligence and we're not bad kids you know you really not look at the good you're doing in the world and when you were talking Juliana nudged me and wrote something on a piece of paper and she said she is a natural teacher. I said she is. One of the questions we ask at interview um, for our student teachers at Brunel is can you share some magical moments of working with young people or children? And your humbleness is really respected, Quezia. You said about the you started your successes with the ground level work you do. And that magical moment of when you were working with a child, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's what really got you thinking, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, you 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 should be. You're a natural teacher. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so, you. I'm just going to move on to the next question, Quasia, and just tell us. So let's say, what is the one thing that you, if you you know, make a wish that you need? from funding bodies or nature organizations just you know make a wish um i think i, I kind of mentioned it before i think with me the main thing from the main it kind of goes together the support and the funding i think that's the two main things because for me and like i say a lot of people like me we have all the ideas we have all these type of things we we, we know what we want kind of thing but when it comes to the support and the funding side of things it can that can be one of the biggest china challenges that we often um sometimes using it as an excuse to to why our ideas don't get um come forth but something that i'd say um is something support for me is something that I value a lot as well support is like something that I really value um even if it's like sharing my stuff or um connecting me with someone that does something that I do or whatever that looks like, however that looks like is I'd say that's one of the the biggest things that I'd um say for me in terms of what I need and just more people coming together and um supporting at if people like to say allies and stuff like that um people coming together for a common kind of goal is something that I find so important and what I feel that I need not just for myself a lot of the things I do is not just about me it's about a wider um me as a whole in terms of my community and everyone that I represent I'd say so um I'd say yeah just that support and um it's not like a me problem that like in in the city people aren't getting out in nature much or stuff like that it's a it's a everyone's problem kind of thing so I think it's important that um people have that mentality too in terms of thinking of things that way that it's not just a us problem yeah. or problem it's a everyone's problem kind of thing yeah yeah <laughs> I don't know I don't think there's a, a better way to do the same um you just uh Anyway, there's I no, so yeah, I don't think I could add anything to that. No. <laughs> so, 
the last question is a future oriented question, right? So what are your plans to move forward in the one can you do? What are your hopes for the future? <laughs> so I often don't like to answer this question um, because I feel like it's so important to live in the present. Um, especially with my background and the things and experiences that I've faced. Uh, looking to the future is not something that we often think about. It's all about living in the present. And I think it's so important to think about now and what's happening now, um, because that's what is going to lead us to our future, essentially. So I think what is so important is thinking about the present. And I suppose leading by example, um, as I often try to do, because it's all about the next generation, essentially. So that's what I'd like to say about the future. Yeah. I was saying you're a very sharp thinker, uh, Gwesia. Um, I didn't really like your answer, actually. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's offers of mentorship at the end of this yeah. from people. Yeah. I don't have the background, unfortunately, yeah. but I'm sure there are people who will be happy to mentor quite you. Quite happy to mentor you, Gwesia. I mean, if I had a background, I certainly wouldn't yeah. uh, in, in this area, um, you know, for, for our nature. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it's what you say about the moment, you know, focusing on the moment and on what, what we need now to inform the future is so important. It is, and it, you know, through a spiritual lens, it is very important to be present as well. And I think that's nice because some, it's that groundedness of being in the present and not feeling overwhelmed. I mean, you know, I, I know people who are suffering from eco anxiety and climate anxiety and all these things where we can, the media discourses out there are quite traumatizing some of them. So I think what you, you bring hope through the lens that you bring to this work, Wesia. You, you bring a hopeful lens through the way you talk, the way you work, the authentic grounded um, experiences that you bring. Um, and it's a really powerful lens. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you. Good morning. Okay, so we we've come to the end of uh, of uh, the the morning session, um, and we're going to have a lunch break, and we hope to see you back. Um, sorry, just going yeah. the time for me. Um, we are at one fifteen. Um, Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So we just going to put the slides, the main slide back, okay. uh, just to show you. Okay. That's green. Yeah. Um, we can move to the um, the slide with the timing. That's it. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay, so um, we will have lunch. We're back at one fifteen, and I'm really hoping that you're coming back for the afternoon session because we have two more speakers. And um, we have um, Mohammed. Mohammed Dalek, and also we have Jasmine Isa Qureshi in the afternoon. And then we will have the Q&A with Anjana and Gita, and also we'll be um, involving the, the speakers, mm -hmm. the panelists, to answer some of the questions that have come up in the, in the Q&A box, because there are some very interesting questions that we want to raise in the afternoon. So we really hope that you'll be back to continue this conversation, um, reminding you of um, the tag on um, the hashtag on Twitter, um, if you would like to share the seminar on Twitter. And I just want to say, just to wrap up this morning, um, one of the common, there are quite a, a number of threads really that yeah. are interweaving. Um, one is around knowledge, um, whose knowledge is powerful and recognized and whose knowledge is made invisible. Um, gatekeeping, um, EDI policies are tokenistic um, if they do not allow those voices that are made, made invisible to actually become powerful voices in the organizations that make decisions. So representation needs to be um, made visible in these organizations, not just tokenistic through words and policies. And the other aspects that's emerged is education, the importance yeah. of education, not just school education, you know, in the classroom and the curriculum, although that is very important. Maxwell talked about black history and the presence of black people in, in British history, 
but that's something that has implications for the curriculum and what we teach in schools. But Quasio example, uh, Quasio's example um, is also about education in the community. So the importance of education, uh, formal and informal education. So I think these three threads, education, gatekeeping, powerful voices and invisible voices and knowledge are coming together. So hopefully we'll be able to think about those threads this afternoon and in day two as well, which we're going to talk yeah. about um, later. Uh, that's really um, helpful, Juliana. And Quezia, I think you're our youngest speaker and you have brought a really powerful lens. Sometimes it can be quite academic, um, maybe intimidating. I don't know how you felt before coming on today, but you're speaking in a university space. And I know when we had a pre-chat earlier, you one of the things that you didn't mention today, which I would like to mention, is the work you're doing is the work you needed when you were younger. And I think that's really powerful because that made me choke when we had a pre-chat is the work you are doing is what you wanted to see. I wish when I was growing up, there was a quesia around in my area. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> um, so every neighborhood, every area needs a quesia, a city girl in nature. Yeah. Um, so really inspiring talks this morning, as Juliana has said, um, from Maxwell, from Dr. Adia, who I played Dr. Adia, and Quezia, and we're super excited now for the afternoon. And um, yeah. And I just want to say Quezia has just added her links to the Q&A. So anyone who wants to um, follow Quezia on social media, watch her videos on YouTube, the links are now on the Q&A box. So feel free to engage with Quezia uh, in her work. Thank you, enjoy your lunch. And we will see you at, if you come back just before 1.15, please. Thank you. Thank bye. You. See you in a bit. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending this morning. And now we're really excited for our afternoon where we've got Mohammed and Jasmine. And then Anjana is going to pull together some key points. It's an absolute privilege to have Mohammed speaking this afternoon. He is an incredibly kind man and a man that is already leaving a legacy in the outdoors world. The work that we're talking about in relation to equality, diversity, inclusion, diverse voices in outdoor spaces is nothing new for Mohammed. He has been active in the outdoor world since his early teens. And he's been doing some incredibly powerful engagement work with black and minority ethnic communities to access countryside spaces and the outdoor world and forward the race equality agendas. He was the winner of the 2019 Churchill Fellowship Award for his groundbreaking research around Black Indigenous people of colour, and he visited North America for that, and some of the implications, the key findings, he embeds into his work in the UK. He is the founder of Mosaic Outdoors, but that's not the only thing he does. Um, he also works in fire and rescue services in Cumbria, and he does an incredible amount of voluntary and public sector work which includes supporting people like me, who are a community activist, through advice, through men informal mentoring. So Mohammed is someone, if you've got a problem or you need advice, you can tap into him <coughs> in, as a safe space. So without further ado, I am going to welcome Mohammed to our first afternoon slot and ask Mohammed to start by setting the context for what he does and the why for what he does. Hi, good afternoon, <clears throat> and thank you for the introduction. Just a correction, I'm chair of Mosaic Outdoors. I didn't found it, um, but I've been involved with it for a number of years. But um, setting the context, what do I do? 
Um, I got involved, as you mentioned, in the outdoors in my teens, and my background is youth work. I did a lot of my youth work in the outdoors, um, taking groups out, um, working in the youth service. And that got me to think around the lack of engagement from um, ethnically diverse communities. Um, and that led me to do some work around engaging those communities, taking them out, particularly at, the, at that time, youth workers and the importance of outdoor education within youth work. Um, I then moved on to sort of carried on that work, but more sort of working with some of the organizations in terms of how we change that thinking and why that wasn't going on. And that was back in the sort of 80s and 90s where I sort of worked with um, various organizations and academics looking at equality of opportunity and the outdoors and, and access to that sort of work. And that sort of work has carried on. Um, I've been into outdoors um, and I've used that as, as, a, as a tool um, for communities I've worked with, but also in my professional roles I've worked with as well. And for me, it's a double, double sort of um, approach, two-pronged approach. One is working with the grassroots, but then that grassroots and also informs that um, high level strategic lobbying as well to get some sustained change across the sector. So it's not just about sort of taking groups out, but um, but but also sustained engagement in the in the in in nature as well and connectedness in nature. So that's sort of, sort of context. And as as you mentioned, I've had a professional role, and this is very much a passion um, of engaging with with the outdoors and allowing communities to engage safely with the outdoors as well. Um, that's really helpful. <clears throat> Thank you for being so concise, Mohammed. Um, and your grassroots work is incredibly strategic, that point you've just raised. Often grassroots, a bit like the work Juliana and I do in the university about community languages. Community languages are always seen as the core partner of modern foreign languages. Um, but it's the same in the outdoor green space work. That community work is often seen as the kind of lower order work, but it definitely isn't. Um, and I love what you've just said there, Mohammed, about it's not just about taking groups out. It's about building those deeper connections. Um, we are, you know, some of the grassroots community leads um, and people like yourself, Quezia, and others we've heard this morning, you are doing far more than just taking groups out into nature. So like the other panelists, Mohammed, we are not starting from a deficit model in this conference. We want you to start by celebrating. What are you proud of about the work you've done to date? Um, celebrate some of your successes with us, please. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll celebrate one second. I'll probably talk about others as well, but. Um, one of the things I noticed back in the early 90s um, while I was working in, in the youth service was how local young people weren't engaged in any of the outdoor activities that I was instructing and leading on. Um, so I actually sort of asked the youth service um, to use a residential center for a weekend and took a group of young people out, teenagers. Um, and there were a lot of issues, even at that time, you sort of go back to the early 90s around young people living in inner city areas. So I got a group together and it was quite hard work um, because people didn't know exactly what and parents didn't know what they were letting themselves in for. Um, so I, I actually had to go around knocking on parents' doors to convince them to let their sons or daughters to come away for a weekend and do a series of activities um, and that worked and we took a group of people out and they really enjoyed themselves and that's going on almost 30 years ago um, and I think for me the success of that was those young people that I took out then um, have continued that work locally by taking young people out now so they're taking young people out in the community young refugees out young asylum seekers out to experience the outdoors and get that experience that they got 30 years ago. Some of them run a city farm and other projects. But something really struck me in terms of the success of that was in December last year, when I did a weekend in, in the 
in the Brecon Beacons um, around how to enjoy the outdoors. Um, and one of the attendees, again, a teenager, well, not so teenager, about 18 years old, 19 years old. And her father came on that very first trip I took away 30 years ago. So it's, it's sort of, for me, it was sort of like that whole cycle of taking the father out when he was a teenager at the age of 16 um, to the Brecon Beacons at that time as well. And then 30 years later, taking um, his daughter out um, to enjoy the outdoors. And I think that's where the sustainability comes in, is, is about sort of looking at how you're working with people, what you're doing, that enables that sort of, that passion for everybody you take out to, to be there and they can pass that on to their kids. And I know that individual with all his um, three daughters and a son, takes them out regularly and, and, and connects with nature on a, on a regular basis. So I think that's sort of one of the successes in terms of that longevity of, of people engaging and, and some of those young people running city farms and doing other activities within nature that allows that to flourish and continue to pass on to new generations. And I think that's, that's for me is the really important bit that it's not a one-off. It's not sort of, oh yeah, let's get access and, and that's about it but it's that continuity. And I think some other successes are, um, again, a very similar experience of when I went to university, um, is taking again, a group of um, students out from different, different courses in Bradford, um, take them out to Lake District. And again, um, they've never been out before. So for them to go out, but also, on that particular day, I was recollecting this story to, to my niece a couple of weeks ago. The weather in the lakes wasn't too good. It was a bit misty and, and rain and you couldn't see much. But they walked up um, an hour or so, slightly moaning because they couldn't see anything but, and only hear water and, and a few sheep. But when they came out of the clouds um, at the top and saw the lake, and the blue skies and they could see for miles with the cloud underneath them a, a cloud inversion that i think made it for those group of people and those individuals again carried on going into the outdoors and nature because that positive experience they had back in sort of 1989 or something and i think that's something that we got to think about is, is having those positive experiences that enables people to carry that work on into the future and those individuals to carry on enjoying nature um, and connecting with nature on a, on a long-term basis. That's really helpful, Mohammed. Thank you so much. And a few points I want to pull up there <clears throat> is I love the way you put yourself out there knocking on parents' doors. And it makes me think of one word there, which is trust. When you knock on parents' doors, they are handing over their most precious thing to you, which is their child. Um, and it's what we say to our student teachers here at Brunel University um, when they are going into classrooms educating children. You know, those parents are handing over their most valuable person in the world to you. So knocking on parents' doors, putting yourself out there to do that. And the, the legacy that you're creating it's not just, it's really evident that you are not a one hit wonder, Mohammed. There's, it's about doing long-term sustainable engagement work. And like you said, it's, it moves beyond one-off access. It's about creating sustainability and the legacy of the work. And there are many more successes, Mohammed, as we know of your work, and we could have a whole conference on them, but we sadly don't have time today. So the next, area we'd like you to talk about, which we've all spoken about, are the unique challenges or barriers, maybe that you've faced personally doing the work you're doing, and Quezia has talked about it through a personal lens and community lens, um, so please take that how you decide to. Yeah, I, th I think there's a whole spectrum of challenges <clears throat> out there in terms of, in terms of nature and the outdoors, and connectedness with nature. And I think we're going to start with sort of um, that one of the one of the biggest challenges, the current challenges is is we're almost sort of reinventing the wheel. 
Um, we're almost sort of thinking that this is all new work. This isn't new. Um, as I said in my opening, going back to the early 90s, late 80s, there are people like Barbara Humberston, um, Elaine Willis, and a whole range of others who were discussing this back in back in um, the late 80s, early 90s, around um, equality of opportunity in the outdoors. So this is nothing new. I again sort of talk about sort of DEFRA in their rural white paper, Our Countryside, Our Future, back in 2000, where I sort of contributed quite a bit in some of the consultation there. Um, they talked about diversity in the outdoors. Um, and there was, at that time, it was a countryside agency, which was, which is now the now Natural England, carried out a diversity review. And it, and it was a good couple of years of work, that diversity review, and a lot of information came out. So a lot of this, this discussion on access and engagement has been going on. My challenge has been that all these organizations, why have they not done anything? It's almost like they don't want to do anything because it doesn't actually help those organizations with their own narratives. And I think if the organizations really are committed to change, both at governmental level, but also at the um, local authority, voluntary sector, NGO level, they actually need to sort of be brave and actually do something because we can talk and they can, and I, I sort of describe this sort of talking and, 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 and what they sort of do in a little way is, is almost diversity washing. They're, they're very much sort of ticking some boxes, as somebody mentioned about ecological, they don't mean anything. They're just pieces of paper unless you actually enact them. As somebody mentioned, you can have as many policies and strategies you like, unless you actually do something, put some resources in, it's not going to change. And the leadership needs to sort of say, right, actually, we're going to make this happen and happen happen properly. And that, and that means actually challenging behaviors and values of organizations and, and addressing some of the sort of real core issues that have been around for many, many years, in some cases, centuries, um, to actually address, address some of these um, challenges we're facing now. Because it's fine saying, yeah, we'll take a group of people out, we'll throw a bit of money here or there. But that's not actually creating sustainable long-term change. How many people are on boards? How many people in senior leadership teams? As, as other people have mentioned this morning, um, the sector is probably the least diverse, um, the second least diverse of all the sectors out there. Volunteering. Um, and again, it's something that um, Glover mentioned. If you want to protect our landscapes into the next 70 years, we have to change, the sector has to change. Otherwise, there will be no, no landscapes to protect because the landscapes will have eroded away because we haven't actually sort of thought about um, engaging young people, new audiences um, in this work. And the other thing I think, again, these organizations lack is, is recognizing, and again, um, a number of people have mentioned um, um, earlier on, both Anjana and Maxwell, um, and others is is the history. Um, there's so much history in our landscapes which nobody talks about or nobody recognizes. Um, last year was the 1900th um, anniversary of Hadrian's Wall. Did anybody here in the in the in the celebrations around the African um, communities that were there 1900 years ago, guarding Hadrian's Wall? Um, the first African, African community to be settled um, in the UK was in Bruff by Sands. Um, so again, there's, a, there's almost a sort of a, an ign ignoring of, of that history that's, that makes up Britain. The first, um, first black police officer in, in the UK, people always look at London or Manchester or Bradford or West Yorkshire, but it's actually in Cumbria, um, the slave trade. Um, you look at some of the national parks, um, the lakes is littered with uh, memories of, of the, the, the slave trade. So again, it's actually sort of thinking about sort of recognizing those sort of things and moving away from that tick box approach to actually real engagement. And, and sometimes people are afraid. And, and I just wanna pick up on the final challenge is many of these organizations, and I think people have talked about, um, earlier on, 
as well is is yeah how do how do they use um use communities um like ourselves in terms of trying to engage with us and, and mostly for free um but there was another another sort of very very worrying thing that's cropped up and it's been happening for a number of years now is how large organizations are using our community groups so we've we've got a number of groups here where the who are using them in funding bids without actually even engaging with them and i think one of the one of the big worrying things for me is is how funders are not doing doing their due diligence to actually check if they've actually engaged with those communities or individuals that they've quoted in their application to say yeah we were engaging with x y and z um, and we'll be working in partnership with them i know of an organ a small community-based organization who were who were quoted in a bid as a partner and they didn't even know until sort of two months after they've been awarded the grant now i think funders have a lot to answer for because they're not funding small organizations that are around this um panel um but they'll fund bigger organizations who are not putting the money into the into the grassroots work and they're taking normally taking a huge chunk out of it as as their as their um as their sort of cost and underwriting it and i think that needs to be changed and funders approach to this needs to be changed and also i think there needs to be less research and more work on on the grassroots and I'd, finally i'd like to end it end with this thing is is everyone should be respected and reflected and engaged in conservation of our landscapes um national parks countryside um and support an inclusive vision but i think people sort of think oh, the problem lies with those communities who can't access this and the other. I think it's to be turned around. The problem lies in the sector, not with the underserved communities. It's a sector who has an issue and they need to sort themselves out and engage with those communities, not the other way around. If the sector did what they needed to and become more diverse and inclusive, those communities will engage, but they don't see themselves and there are no role models. Um. <clears throat> Mohammed, I think, yeah, you have a standing ovation here and from people in the audience as well. You've raised some bold points. They may be obvious to you, but obviously not to everybody. You've highlighted things like let's not reinvent the wheel. Um, and you've been doing this work for a long time. You use the, in inverted commas, commas using organization and funding bids as well. Um, and off we know the way, the way that the agenda works. Um, large organizations need community groups to show that they're making an impact. So they're often used as well. Diversity washing, I've written down. And a point that's coming up repeatedly in your talk is sustainable long-term change. That seems to be an underpinning mantra in what you're saying. And it's real engagement that moves beyond the superficiality of diversity washing and tick boxes. Um, and the sector has to change. My colleague Juliana was nodding. Did you want to say anything on that, Juliana? No, I was just, um, just basically going, yes, yes, and yes. I don't have anything to add, but um, applause, standing ovation. Standing ovation on those points. Thank you. So, Mohammed, you've been doing this work for a long time. What is it that you think you need? Maybe it's not what you need in particular, or maybe it's what you need. What spaces do you need to enter now? Because the knowledge and expertise of people like you we can't afford to lose it. So where is, what is the challenge for you with all this knowledge and expertise, lived experiences that you hold? I think the first thing is, the sector has to recognize that it's got a problem um and then they need to actually address that problem um and engage with those communities and and it's having those seats around the table what i need is is people around this room having seats around the table too many a times um many of us have, have put in for roles at, 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 in board levels and stuff and it's interesting how we're always told we're come second um when I know of people who have expertise in law, in climate change, um, they're doing work internationally, but for some reason, when it comes to um, appointment to a board, 
they don't seem to have the necessary experience or skills to sit on that board. So I think there's an element of, of the, the sector recognizing that it has a problem and it needs to change. I think what I need is, is that real commitment um, to change that it, it it shouldn't be as you as as I mentioned earlier as you as you reinforced that it shouldn't be diversity washing. It's not about throwing a few pennies here and there. It's not about sort of oh we'll do this or we'll we'll do this and or we'll we'll partner with somebody to get some social media likes and 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 so on and so forth because that's not changing the the sector as such. It's actually just sort of painting a picture of yeah we're doing something, ticking a few boxes, getting a few pounds worth of funding. I think that clearly there needs to be sort of sustained resources invested in, into this work and resources invested that actually build capacity of the communities and groups. <clears throat> a lot of money invested is actually in some ways wasted because it's not actually invested in terms of long term commitment to, to developing the work. It's sort of invested in a way that actually works for a couple of years. An end to short term projects end to two or three year projects. If you're going to invest in some of this work and it's going to be sustained, it needs to be long term because we have too many. By the time a project starts and it starts delivering, the staff are thinking of leaving because the project's ending in the next year's time. So there is no sustainability, no continuity. So I think I think there needs to be sustained. And I think national organization and funding bodies who were involved in this, whether it's AONBs, national parks, whether it's Natural England, whether it's whoever they are who are providing, they need to think in terms of, is this going to build capacity in those communities? Is this going to be sustainable? And fund actual groups that will do the work, not sort of top level bodies who will then commission other people to do the work and, and then sort of you get lost in, 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 in sort of trying to work out what's actually going on and, and it's not sustainable. So I think for me, the change will come um, in terms of actually the sector accepting it and making a move towards that cultural change within the organizations and, and not denying. And we're seeing at the moment how much denial the, the commissioner and the Mets will not admit that there's institutional racism and misogyny and homophobia in the Metropolitan Police Service. Um, when the report, case report clearly talks about what the issues and challenges are. And I think the sector, what we don't want is, is, is that sort of report coming out for the sector to highlight that actually there, there is a whole load of institutional issues within the sector. We know there is. The sector needs to recognize it is and, and they're going to move to that cultural change. Unless you recognize it, you won't be able to deal with it. And I think that's really important. And then I think there's due diligence around funding and that sustainability and having people, authentic people around the table because at the moment, there's a lot of, again, as I said, diversity washing going on. Let's get somebody who's got 20,000 followers so we get lots of PR and publicity. Actually, that's not changing the sector at all in terms of all it's doing is, is giving you a bit of a profile. So let's actually make some real change, authentic change that actually changes the sector for the long term and engage with the communities. Because as, as Maxwell said, the green agenda is for everybody, not just for white. Um, people and I'm, uh, a conversation a number of us had earlier at end of last year was when when the when the whole conversation was going about protecting nature it was all the white organization no <clears throat> color organizations of color were involved in that whole conversation it's like we're used when we need to be used but not when it's actually important when the whole thing matters to us so I think that's really important that's really helpful you've touched on so many points and I can see comments coming up from the panelists to say applause, thank you, and comments coming up there. Um, you talk about changing culture, you talk about capacity building, deep engagement, I'm thinking here is what you're really, you know, the philosophy. And we, you know, community groups, they don't want to be used. <laughs> it's not just about this commercial social media type of tick box. Um, and we know how that works, where I've been asked as a grassroots community activist several times, can we come to your group and take pictures? Um, or could you send us some pictures for, for our pages? And these are institutions and that's not the way we work because 
we have an ethical commitment to the communities that we serve. And the other point, you, we want authoritative people who are genuinely embedded around tables. Um, and we shouldn't be begging for those seats around the table. Um, those seats, we should have a space around those tables because the voices of people like you matter. Um, I don't expect you to say this, but I'm being bold, Mohammed. Is there a particular table you think you should be at? <laughs> Or you'd rather not say. Rather not say. <laughs> okay, right. So thank you for that, Mohammed. So, what what is what are your hopes for the future? What do you think? Oh, I've got Quezia here. I've got to share this. Quezia said, "Let's create a new table." Go, Quezia. <laughs> and and. Um, I know you're talking about another next question about future oriented, and I think Quasi is right. Let's create a new table. If if those existing tables are excluding us, let's create our own table and show them what we can do, because that way we will be able to set our own agenda. And let's, I, I think somebody, I can't remember where it was a few years ago, let's create our own natural park or our own landscape area and run it for our communities. And I think I think it's important because I think we need we need sort of to look at it from like somebody mentioned role models and mentors. Um, my role model that came about, um, I found a role model sort of 15, 20 years ago, and it was a guy called um, Shelton Johnson. Um, and he is um, somebody I read an article from an, in the paper. And I really appreciate his work because he was looking at it from um, in Yosemite and the history of Yosemite where over a hundred years ago, the first rangers were black African-American soldiers, Buffalo soldiers who came to guard the first national park um, over a hundred years ago, but they weren't recognized anywhere. As I mentioned earlier on about the soldiers and the legions on, on Hadrian's wall and the emperors, black emperors, African emperors on Hadrian's wall. And fortunately, as you mentioned, I had the Churchill Fellowship and I had the opportunity to visit um, North America and to visit Yosemite and to actually spend a few days with him and, and talk to him and learn from him and his wisdom and knowledge that he shared about the work he's been doing in engaging the African-American Latino communities in the National Park Service in the UK, in, in, in the US. And for me, um, I know this is not going to happen, and I know it, there's a partnership probably going to be coming along, but it's, it's sort of, do we go down the road of a national landscape service um, that, like the Americans have, that provides uh, a very clear format that each landscape isn't their own. It's, it's part of a national protected landscape, and therefore there's, a, there's a, 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 a consistent approach to it all, not sort of differential approach, which I think national parks have at the moment. That's really helpful, Mohammed. I'm so, really sorry that I'm going to have to pause you there because of time. Okay. But your points are ringing true with many, many people. I really respect your honesty, your experience of somebody who is has deep lived experience in this space and critical. You bring a really critical lens, just like Maxwell as well. And I like this idea of a new table, Quezia. Um, and I wonder if this conference space today could be the start of a table which is quite critical and brings a different lens. So, Mohammed, thank you. Thank you um, very much. And just thank you for being in this space. You're very present. It's a bit like what Abia said in her talk where I was speaking for Abia, that actually our very presence in this space is um, critical as well. So I'm going to hand back to my colleague Juliana, who's now going to be shining a spotlight on Jasmine's work. Thank you. Okay. Um, you just, um, um, Jasmine. Okay, Jasmine. Yeah. Right. Now, um, we have our final speaker, Jasmine Gita Qureshi, and um, 
We are very excited to have your powerful voice uh, included in our seminar day, Jasmine, um, because um, we think, you know, this is a beautiful end to this uh, very exciting day, I find it's been a quite emotional at times as well. So we, are, we, we feel very privileged to have you with us today. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction. I, I think you will not capture all your activities because you, you seem to be so active and do so much. So apologies if I don't capture everything. Uh, but uh, Jasmine is a Quraysh, she's a writer, storyteller and journalist. Uh, Jasmine worked at World Space Productions on a series for Netflix, uh, for the BBC Natural History Unit as well. Jasmine is also an ambassador for the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Um, and through public speaking, Jasmine discusses topics related to diversity, nature, in particular in relation to sexuality, identity, gender, and trans rights. And Jasmine, uh, I think there's also a, a book in the works. Um, I don't know if you want to tell us more about it, but um, if you want to begin with um, the context setting for your activities, and maybe you can talk to us about new exciting development. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say first, it has been a real privilege to hear so many incredible voices. I, I've worked with, I think everyone or most of the people here in some capacity, um, just coming up in terms of my um, journey in the conservation sector. And it's so it's so cool to hear so many different perspectives, but also such strong, confident voices, because I do remember growing up and not seeing a confidence and a personal power and a personal respect in terms of who was speaking about these spaces um, and the people who came from my community or who were represented um, in these in these arenas. And I never saw that. And so seeing that now is really powerful and and very much um spurs me on and inspires me so thank you for inviting me to this conference um to to be alongside um all of these amazing people but yeah i think for me my my work um has almost come out of desperation and necessity as it were um for me the starting point of my journey was one of passion and one of interest I have been interested and passionate about wildlife, in particular insects um, and uh, marine wildlife and conservation of that wildlife and protection of it. From a really, really early age, um, I grew up in uh, the center of London. So I grew up in an area where I was living above a shop. Um, I didn't have a garden. There were no reserves nearby. There were no gardens um, that I could access. There were no green spaces that I could access. Um, and I was also homeschooled um, till about uh, year nine. So I really lived in this almost isolated bubble. And I like when Quezia was talking about it being a bubble because it really is the community that you grow up with. You feel safe in that community because it's everyone who has experienced the same things as you. And that experience is one of limited access. And so you feel safer in that bubble because there aren't any unforeseen narratives. There's nothing that you can't predict almost. Um, and that's what safety I think comes down to. So growing up in that, in that arena um, and in that environment, I had to gain all of my passion and my interest and my love for wildlife through documentaries. And those were mainly David Attenborough documentaries, things like Spring Watch. And I'd watch them on devices because we didn't have a TV. And so I really, I grew my love of wildlife through watching these documentaries and thinking that I badly wanted to see it. I badly wanted to see it in person. I wanted to study it. I wanted to share my interest with people. And so I read a lot when I was younger. And I remember um, looking at insects that I found in these urban areas that I grew up in. And that's where my first interest came from. And as I grew up and I decided that I wanted to do volunteering and that I wanted to write about the nature that I saw. And I started my blog when I was about nine, just talking about wildlife and my interest in it. I realized it wasn't easy because actually all I wanted to do was look at wildlife. All I wanted to do was study it. I wanted to understand it. I wanted to understand science. I wanted to write about things, to be creative with how I presented these stories and how I constructed these narratives, but I couldn't do it. 
And I realized I couldn't do it first off because of who I was and where I came from. I grew up in a very strict Muslim um, household. I am Pakistani Indian, and I really didn't have access to a lot of resources in terms of how we could learn about nature, how we could learn about wildlife, but also how we could present ourselves as teachers in this environment. I remember watching a lot of presenters on TV and not seeing myself represented. So one of the reasons I got into one of the jobs that I do, which is as a researcher for wildlife television, is because I wanted to change how people told those stories. And this comes down to a big part of my work, which is changing perspectives and reimagining how we think and learn about these topics. Um, and as I grew up, I also came out. I also understood my transness, my queerness, and I have reflected on my race and my religion. And I have managed to give seminars and talks about this because my understanding of intersectionality is that all of the different points in my life and all of the different learning points that I have come across whilst being interested and wanting to learn more about natural history and further our understanding of it is that true intersectional learning actually has to almost disrupt and take apart and dissect the system by which we learn and exist at the moment. And by doing that, we then have to relearn through the cultural dialogues, through the intersectional understanding and through the learned behavior and lived experience of indigenous people, of people of color, of colored communities, of minority communities, of grassroots organizations, of socialist organizations. These are all things that come into my work. And these are all things that everyone experiences every day. So I just think through my work as ambassador um, for insects, which is not something I see for people like me, for someone who talks about um, misogyny and patriarchy in the natural history sector, for someone who talks about my own heritage and my own um, linking to indigenous communities in Pakistan um, and through my parents and everything that I am. I put it into this because at the end of the day, I just want to look at wildlife and love it and observe it. And I want everyone who's like me to love it and observe it. And I've realized that the only way I can do that is by writing about my opinions and trying to change the policies and laws and the perspectives that we think by in order to create an environment where it's not simply an echo chamber of the same people talking about the same things. It's people unlearning these things and then relearning them and teaching a generation, a new generation, a new way of thinking. That's me. Um, I was just nodding away. Um, I like beautifully said, and particularly how you really managed to bring everything together um, with intersectionality. Um, you know, it's about, you mentioned misogyny and patriarchy. It's not something we talked about today, but it, it, it is very important. Um, and it links in so beautifully with what we talked about, race, representation, um, because obviously trans rights and, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's an important discussion that we need to have in these spaces. And also you mentioned religion as well. So all those different identities and how they intersect, um, very, very important to consider. So thank you for your sharing your lived experience with us. It's actually quite moving. Yeah. So I'm just going to move now to the next question because otherwise I'll start crying. So, okay. um, so successes. You have many successes to share and I'll, um, um, So do you want to share some of your stories of impact? And I'm just nudging you now to talk about your book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. Yeah, I actually forgot to even um, mention that when I was talking about um, the kind of, um, I think, the background to what I do in my work. But yeah, I think for me, my greatest successes have been where, like we've seen with the previous speakers, you see a real light bulb moment with people. Um, and I was talking to someone recently about this, that the idea that you, um, that you notice change in yourself is something that's so easily conversed about and so easily told to audiences and to people that it is the hardest thing in the world for oneself to really see that change within yourself and to, to also see an issue that needs to be changed within yourself. 
that takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of self-confidence and strength and self-respect, which is not something that's been afforded to minorities, especially in the natural history industry. And the, the history of elitism in land ownership, land management, the history of systemic patriarchy has, has you know, taken that away from us. So for me, the successes lie within seeing that, that change from the down up. And so I'd say my recent successes have been delivering workshops um, and I've managed to do this via um, a scheme called Writing Our Legacy and they have a bursary scheme called Shifting the Gaze and that, that bursary scheme basically gets writers of colour and writers who are minorities who are working in the natural history and nature um, industries and also who just simply want to experience this um, this area that they've not been allowed to before and they are trying to get their message their lives and their experiences across and so as a mentor I work with um, the organization to teach these people how to talk about their experiences in their own words and how to get it out it's almost a therapy session using writing words and reflection and so for me the greatest success has has been gleamed from those workshops because I see people at the end of the workshops think oh my god I I don't need to go away and learn a great amount of edu of 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 knowledge to be allowed to access these spaces I don't need to gain a degree in this and then gain a degree in this and then travel to this place I have it within me already and a big thing that I love to talk about and again that has been another success for me has been doing talks in places like the Natural History Museum, in places um, that I never thought I'd ever go to, like the Eden Project. These are far off places that I see, I, I saw as a, as a kid, and I never thought that I could ever visit them. And I go to them and they're very white, and they're very male-centered, and they're very cisgender, very binary-centered. And I go in there with my spectrum-based way of understanding um, nature, and my queer way of understanding ecology, and I basically dissect it in front of them. And that light bulb moment for me, again, when I see people understand that they as a minority belong in this space more than anyone else because of the obstacles and the experience that they have gained and the amount of reflection and the amount of fight that they've had to go through to get to this, to get to this point in their lives, that makes them so much more treasured in this space. That is the greatest success for me. And the book has really come out of that because I have I have been writing since I was very, very young. Um, it's, I think, the best way I find of expressing myself. And that is a privilege on my part. It's a privilege that I get to be able to write in a way that I, I imagine is eloquent and fluent and something that not a lot of people are allowed. So part of my teaching comes to being able to give people that privilege. Um, and so the book has come out basically through me understanding that in order to get people to learn and unlearn this idea that they are taught about ecology, biology and nature in such a binary fashion that splits us into groups based on our stereotypical gender roles, that splits us into how we learn about things based on where we come from, how we speak, the amount of education we have access to, the the areas we have access to, the places we live, all of these need to be unlearned and then we need to relearn why teaching about new ways of learning is so important. And this whole idea of queer ecology, which is what um, I've seen it coined as, and this idea of learning about things in a different way than they are currently taught and learning that not everything is black and white or just one thing or the other. It's not binary, it's very spectrum based. I wanted to teach people about this idea and I realized the way I could do it was through a nature memoir and through basically writing about my life and where I've come from, from the, the beginnings in London being um, Muslim and AMAB, which means assigned male at birth and growing up in that environment. And then further on through learning and reflecting on myself and where I am, through understanding what it means to be a woman, to understanding what misogyny is, how it plays a part in cutting people out of conversations, in learning what racism was, how that cuts people out of uh, um, conversations. Um, and 
through learning about television and media and how people are represented and what that means for younger generations in terms of how they learn about wildlife. That's what the book's about. It's and I think it hopefully will be a really great success because what it will basically do is put this edge on nature memoirs because nature memoirs are very much we see them written by a lot of the same people. And it's a lot of opinionated love for the natural world. And that is completely fine, but it leaves out the inaccessibility and it leaves out the cultural dialogues and the great beauty that we have as minorities in terms of our lived experience and what we've had to go through and how we can inject that into our dialogues around the natural world. And it's why we should be and are the curators and the leaders in these areas of nature and green spaces and why we should continue to have that progressed. So I think for me, that is my greatest, my greatest um, successes are being able to promote those ideologies and also almost to teach people not to listen sometimes to everything they're told. And a lot of the time, not to listen to what I've told them to do. Um, and that comes through this great idea of unlearning and this great idea that education is at the moment a currency. It is a currency through which people are allowed to access certain spaces. And we see that through policy. We see that through governmental management. We, th we see that through um, education programs and through how we teach people things. And I fundamentally disagree that the level of education that you have should allow you access to something as simple as raw and as indigenous as nature and natural history and so I love to tell people that even though I have my degree in marine biology it is something that I love to do and I would love to continue to learn for the sake of learning and not so that I am allowed to access certain conversations and certain tables because actually people with lived experience and communities are so much more important in those conversations. So yeah, I, I think I've rambled a bit, but I, I think no, I've talked about no, some no, of no, my- No, not at all, Jocelyn. You really oh. did not, I could listen to you all day. And uh, I urge you to write the book, please. Uh, we all want to read it now. Can we please come to the book launch as well? <laughs> But yes, no, please do write it. And uh, we, we'll, we'll certainly be reading it. And I do like, the way you talk about unlearning and dismantling binaries. I really am very happy that you um, are introducing gender here and misogyny and queer thinking, queer because ecology. queer ecology, I love that. Um, it is very, very important to add that angle to what we're trying to do, what we want to do today. So beautifully said. Um, so you didn't ramble at all. Um, now, the next question is challenges. So what are the unique barriers, challenges you encountered? I think we can, I think we know what, what they are mm. from what you've said. But if you just want maybe to tell us uh, in more detail about some of the barriers that you encountered. Yeah, definitely. And like you said, uh, I've um, somewhat talked about some of the barriers in terms of structuring what I think successes are based on those. Um, and a lot of the other talkers have, um, you know, that they've spoken about racism and the fact that it is accessibility in terms of education. But I would like to hone on, hone in on this binary gender patriarchal problem. Um, and that, for me, has been one of the largest obstacles more recently, and more recently because I've begun to realize the microaggressions which have been directed towards me because of the intersectionality of my identity, and a big part of that is my gender. And we find that in a lot of these spaces, you have to have a certain level of knowledge, you have a certain level of education, but you also, you, you have to have it in a very subtle manner because it's not that they ask you at the gate how much education you have, it's that you will only find the gate if you have a certain level of education. And that certain, certain level of education is generally only afforded to people who have time and to people who, are, who have a, le a level of security and comfort. And if you think about the level of security and comfort that people have, that means that they live without a certain level of anxiety, they live without a certain level 
of stress in the world that they exist in. And these problems can very much be tracked back to people who are always fighting for their place in a certain industry and who are also working to be at the same level as, as everyone else. And of course, this has its bearings and its links in race, but it has a very strong um, link to gender. And I think the way that our society has been built is very much for, at its center, the cisgender, straight, male, um, white um, gaze. And it's for that kind of perspective. And I like to view intersectionality as a 3D model. Um, and it's almost this spherical 3D model. I'm gonna try and explain this um, and do stop me if it's not accessible, um, but I, I view it as a spherical model. And at the core of it is the perspective of the cisgender white straight male and coming out of it in layers is everyone along those intersectional points that shares some level of privilege with that identity. So you have white, you have cisgender, you have straight, you have able-bodied, all of these come out in various ways. And you can view it as the privilege goes outwards, so it gets thinner as much as you go out. And so on the outer layers will be people who don't experience as much privilege. And the obstacles go inwards. So the people on the outside will experience the obstacles the most. And as you travel inwards, they will experience it the least. And we find that gender very much governs a lot of how of a lot of information that we can access because of the systemic problem of patriarchy in our society, which means that women are seen as caregivers, they are seen as vulnerable, they are seen as mothers, which is a superpower and is a strength, but it is often seen in society as something to be closed away, something to be used for something else. And we find a lot of the time that means that a lot of the policies and education systems are by almost by um, side effect created by males and created by masculine ideologies, which means they teach only a certain level of based and live, uh, lived experience. And that means that people are learning things in this heteronormative, very male-centered way. And that means that they're only gonna teach things in that way. So I think we need to dismantle these systems of learning and understand what gender has to do with learning and education because I found that to be a very strong problem for me, especially as a transgender woman in this, in this arena, because I'm not really seen, I think, as one or the other, or as anything really that is to be respected or understood. And I'm not seen as someone who should have a voice because there is so little representation because of how it's been taught. So I would say that for me, it's gender has been a very big struggle for me, but also my queerness, and my understanding that a lot of the communities that I uh, that I am in don't get access to a lot of these different areas. And we've talked about race. Um, and I would also say that age is a big one. I do talk to a lot of different age groups, ranging from young to old. And I find that the extremities of these of these um, ages don't get access. Very young people aren't targeted in terms of education, in terms of natural history and green spaces, and very old people aren't either. Um, and as much as everyone has a limited access, they have the most limited access. So I think there needs to be an opening of who is taught and who teaches these, um, these lessons and how they are taught. We really need to restructure the entire system. Yes, we do need to restructure the entire system. Um, and I, I like the spotlight, you know, on heteronormativity and binary thinking and gender. I think it's so important. And also, uh, thank you for, for your um, image, through the image of intersectionality. I think it's very powerful. Would you say it's a bit like the layers of an onion? I'm sorry if I'm sort of... Uh, no, no, I, um, I definitely... I would say just picture it as the layers of an onion, you know, we're like peeling an onion. Would that would you say that would I, be yeah, I would say that because I normally I normally structure it as like the rings of a tree because I like to bring it back to <laughs> that. that <laughs> Um, arena but because a, you know when you cut a tree like that and you see its rings that's such a lateral view I think intersectionality is so much more complex than 3D that 
I've almost had to evolve it into an onion. So I think that's a really, yeah, that is a really good way of, of describing it. Um, and yeah. yeah, I think the intersectional way of thinking, it's, it can be very hard to grasp, but mm. what we need to do is inject it into people's way of thinking so that they can change their perspectives and actually make long-term sustainable change to a lot of communities that don't get it. Yeah, it is about the multiplicity of voices, you know, so mm -hmm. having having these multiple voices to highlight all the intersectional inequalities mm -hmm. um, that, um, you know, we all live under in a very binary, heteronormative, patriarchal society. Um, so um, now one question is, you know, you know what the next question is, what do you need? So can you tell us one, one of the things that would help you in your work, you know, this type of support? that would help you in, in the very important work that you do? I think, and I've been thinking about this um, for a while actually, as the other speakers were saying what would help them. And I really resonated when um, someone was talking about funding, but I resonated it from the point of view of being given time and being given peace of mind. Because again, I think a key factor in terms of creativity is being comfortable and secure and comfortability and security for me can come through funding. It can come through being given a space to enjoy and to really learn and create things. And for me, that peace of mind hasn't been something that I've had for a very long time. I, because of my queerness um, and because of my background, I don't talk to my family um, anymore. I don't really have the support links in terms of um, a community to rely on. I'm very much have a lot of the time been forced into freelancing because I my mental health has struggled too much to work in these areas. And for me, that's quite sad because I'm trying to inspire a new generation of people to get involved with nature. I'm trying to restructure old policies, but a lot of the time I'm doing it um, on my own. And I have had a lot of help from Anjana. I've had it from a lot of the people um, in this in this room and on this panel, and I'm so grateful for that. But there is this um, this almost self issued problem of not wanting to ask for help, and that comes through really struggling. I think a lot of the people here have struggled with that this inability to seek out help because you feel you're the only one you can rely on because of a lot of people maybe um, almost greenwashing you and culturally washing you and all of these other techniques um, into thinking that you won't receive the help that you want when you reach out. So I think there needs to be a lot more support in terms of showing people that sustainable help and the mentoring schemes are a really good way of doing that. But I think funding and giving people a safe space to exist and that security in terms of giving them time and allowing them to basically work in a flexible, very safe, very comfortable manner. I do find that the fast based, um, the fast paced um, work that I see being done a lot of the time in education and in conservation and um, in impact, um, uh, impact um, work and basically a lot of the, a lot of the um, workshops that I see, these are very fast paced. And I don't agree that the work that I'm doing should be done in that way. It should be a very, a very personal journey. It should be a journey that is long and that you understand yourself with. So I would say for me, the most, yeah, the thing that would help me the most is being given that time. And that would come through things like mental schemes, funding. And I think a lot of people would relate to that in terms of being given that support um, throughout their careers. Because I find my career has been dotted with certain opportunities that I've had to take and then I've built upon um, in order to give me more experience. But there are some things that I, I definitely didn't want to do um, and certain jobs that I didn't want to take, but I've had to take because of the support that I needed to um, flex some of the creative muscles that I have. Thank you. I think, I think you raised some very powerful issues here. Um, time, and they're all tied together. Time and financial security and mentorship. Um, Gita, you said uh, you were writing a oh, yeah. Gita, do you um, have to Jasmine, I just want to come back to that point of time. 
and safe space. Um, I don't know if you know Neil Morpoir's work on space invaders. I can send you the reference oh. to Neil Morpoir's book. I think it would be very helpful mm -hmm. for some of the points you raised theoretically. He talks about being space invaders. And um, you talk about that. And the other thing is time is not free. People often think because you don't charge for something or whatever, and time is a privilege, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and having, it's fine having the time, but it's having that creative head, headspace as well where you're not traumatized or your mental health is depleted to the point where you really can't think and work effectively. So like Juliana's just said, these points about flexibility, funding, time, mentorship, safe spaces, the inability to ask for help or seek help. And it's this fast pacedness that we were talking about earlier that Mohammed raised about projects being short-term projects. It's like these one hit wonders. Mm -hmm. And what we're hearing today is people are genuinely interested in long-term sustainable legacy work, which is mm -hmm. going to inspire the next generation. So yeah, I'll hand back to Juliana to talk about the last question. Okay, so last question is the future. Um, so what are your plans moving forward? I think um, I would really love to be able to build on all the experience that I have, um, because I think when people look at what I've done, they see a lot of different experience with this core um, aspect of storytelling. And I think for me, at the base of it, I am a storyteller. And I would like to have that as a nod back to my ancestors, my, um, my culture, and the people who I've learned from, and really nature itself because nature is the best storyteller I find. And for me, as a storyteller, I think my future is, is that. I see myself being a storyteller in terms of writing, in terms of giving my seminars, and of building a cohort of people who tell stories, but who tell stories because they want to learn about things, not because they simply want their stories to be a closed, locked point in history. They want it to be almost points that open up new pathways for conversations and for discussion like this um, conference and like other conferences that I've been to and, and other events. I want my storytelling to open up new dialogues because I know that I don't know everything there is to know because of course I can't because not everyone, you know, that's impossible. But I wish to learn more, but I also wish to give a spotlight and a, and a platform to other people who who would know more than me about certain topics. And I hope that my storytelling can do that. So yeah, I, I would love to continue writing, but I also, I want to see more sustainable change because as has been said before, it's the hope that keeps people going. It's the hope that this, this sector can change. And it's the hope that we can actually do some real good with the experiences that we've had, even if they are traumatic. We almost, we, we have to be able to think that they can help us and they can help other people to not have those same experiences of having limited access to things. Um, and for me, that comes through storytelling, whether that be via um, filmmaking, which is something I also do, whether that be through books, whether that be through writing articles. Um, and really, it's all been tied very much to my own journey and through my own journey of reflecting and understanding myself, I've come to, almost respect, understand, and agree with a lot of other people's stories because of the things that I've gone through. And I think we all do that. We are all an interwoven web in terms of um, the society that we are because we have all of these journeys, we have all of these experiences, and we meet each other and different people along the way, and we relate to them. And if we can just understand that it needn't be this straight-laced, very much this is the beginning, this is the end of our journey. And instead it is this very flexible, very mycelium-like, um, which is um, undergrowth of, of mushrooms and, and how they grow. I really like that as, as a way of talking about how our journeys start and end. They could go anywhere, they could fruit anywhere in terms of um, where, they, where they are shown, where they manifest. And I think I would like my storytelling to do that because I think it will inspire people and I think it will instill in them some hope and that at the base of it is what we need in this fight is hope that it will change. Um, and I gain a lot of that from seeing a lot of the speakers and a lot of the work that the people here have done. So I would hope that that continues to be 
um, something I see in the future and something that I see other people do in the future. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, this is the perfect way really to end the day. Well, it's not the end, we, we, we have yeah. a, another section, but such a powerful way to end our wonderful lineup of speakers, really. Um, we've covered a whole spectrum of, of different approaches to nature and ended beautifully with your lived experience. And we feel very privileged that you shared your, your, um, your story with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. So we're now going to, we're not going to have a break, so we're going to go straight in to um, the Q&A now. Um, so we've had several questions and panelists can unmute themselves. So I'm going to share a few of these. Um, so I'll just take one from somebody who says, education seems to be the root of many of the topics and themes raised today. How can influencing, um, how can influencing bodies in environmental spaces speak to educational policy makers to argue for a curriculum that represents diverse histories and diverse knowledge bases? So if I just kind of throw out the questions, there may be certain threads as well. So if we just go down, so that's one about education and Juliana's already said, how education has been a real thread through this today. And we've seen through some of the work that people are doing, everybody is educating in different ways. Another question someone's raised, I'm interested, um, my question is what can the allies do to best support individuals and communities that face marginalization and discrimination? Thank you. And we are going to talk about allyship on day two a little bit more. So what can the allies do? And how can we encourage a greater diversity of students studying earth and environmental sciences at school and university? How do we show that careers in these areas are valid and interesting? You can't be what you can't see. So how do we break this vicious cycle? Um, I'm over 50 and a grandmother now. And something I said to my husband on a walk the other day is I wish there was somebody around maybe someone like Quezio or one of you, um, when I was growing up, who inspired me to do a different kind, take a different academic path maybe today. Um, so we've talked about that. Um, I'm interested to, um, and I'm interested to know if there's any historical evidence, I know Maxwell's not here now, of people of color taking part in the original Kinder's trespass. Was this protest? wholly owned by white working class people, but we will ask Maxwell that through email. So there's education, different strands, and I'm gonna to hand to Anjana, and if anybody wants to support Anjana, they can. And Anjana's also going to pull together, as she always does so beautifully, and I've often put Anjana on the spot on my educational walks, where I say, Anjana, please pull together some of the things particularly on the Rivers Walk we did recently. Mm -hmm. So, Anjana, over to you, please. I'm going to shine a spotlight on you. Did you want me to comment on the educational? Yeah, yeah, things? please do. Because there, there are two related questions there. Um, having worked in um, science education and outreach, uh, this was at the Jurassic Coast for about 15 years, it's a really, real. the critical point is reaching the influencers who are taking children forward on their learning journeys. So those are parents and carers in the homes where children are. And then you're, you're thinking about the educators within the schools and the colleges. And it, it's a challenge because if, you, if, if we address that point made by Claire, which is how do you encourage and and kind of enhance awareness of career pathways into conservation, geoscience, biodiversity, then you have to work with the parents and the carers and the influences within the home environment. Because no matter what happens in the school system, and I've seen this myself over 15 years of working with teachers on earth science programs, no matter what you do in the classroom, those children will go home and they'll be battling against a cultural system um, 
within their family that is encouraging them to choose careers elsewhere or perhaps not encouraging them to choose careers. It really, really does depend on, on the family situation. Um, and we've, we've done this through the NERC funded programme, which is Walking the Walk, um, bringing in intergenerational groups into nature and, and kind of beginning to influence parents and carers to see nature as a career option. But essentially, um, that won't happen until you have those really critical role, role models writing the books in the media um, and really shouting high from the rooftops with a strong, clear voice that this space is for you as well. And that is a very, very difficult place to get into. Myself, I've been in uh, broadcast work for over 13 years and um, it, is a, it is a huge struggle to to get recognition in a system where you aren't seen as a valid voice, where where one person, a commissioner or a controller is controlling essentially who is whose face goes in front of a camera that's then talking about that narrative. And Jasmine will know about this very well, that it literally does come down to a commissioner. So we have to, and I think Quezia said this excellently, we have to create our own table. So we within our communities we have to use that power within ourselves to organize and rally um our community groups to take ownership and power in those green spaces to lead that narrative and lead that conversation i you know i think we're well over the the victimhood of it all you know we can constantly work in a deficit model but let us all move towards a model where we are empowered and enabled and taking agency in our decision making processes where we are claiming that space for ourselves as Dadi Mars, as Muslim hikers as black girls hike they're all people of color paddle we're all moving in that direction now and I think we it I think one of the speakers talked about it I've got I've, possibly Jasmine you talked about looking ahead moving forward and I think that's the way to go. So I'm going to hand over to someone that's, else on the panel. Yeah, thank you, Anjana. That's really important. And the reason Juliana and I scaffolded the questions to start with successes is because we, like you just said, we're beyond the victimhood. You know, we've been talking about the trauma, the racism, you know, all the other forms of discrimination now. And I think we're, we are far more than our trauma. City, um, Quezia's got her hand up, so I'm going to hand over to Quezia. Yeah, um, exactly what Adjana said is, I'd just like to like echo that, but also just to also add in that some people, I know often we look at home, school, but a lot of the time we don't address also community because some pe there is a group of people that aren't necessarily, don't necessarily have a home environment or a school environment too so those people can often like be like looked over sometimes as well so just to like add that into it there's that community element where people have like their support groups or um a, a community calf or a youth club or whatever it looks like a, a football team or whatever it looks like um but yeah there's also that community element to where um we often forget about um other than school and the home environment. So just to add that into what Adriana said. That's really helpful, Quezia. And Juliana was talking about that, weren't you, earlier? Mm -hmm. About the, we shouldn't underestimate the community work that's going on. I'm going to hand over to Jasmine. Yeah, I would also like to echo that um, community aspect. Um, and I think for me, um, a big question that I always get asked is how do you deal with a lot of the obstacles and the failures of the system that you're working in? Um, and my answer would be, I don't really deal with them very well. And so my security and my confidence and my self-respect comes from having a community and a support system to lean on when I have faced a lot of pain and obstacles in those areas and then I can lean on that community and that structure when I'm feeling tired or when I have fought too much or when I'm just exhausted from a system that doesn't or isn't tailored to me and so then I can go back in with a renewed sense of fight because you have this this cup that isn't always empty you can then refill it in your community and your 
your social settings. So I would really echo that, that community aspect, but also that structure, um, that support system. We really need to work on getting people back into those areas where they're not working or fighting alone. And a big, I think a big aspect of my journey has been trying to reach out to my own communities and trying to find my place in communities where I feel most comfortable and most safe. And I think our job as people leading these discussions is to build those communities so that people don't have to go through what we did and build them ourselves or go through trial and error in finding communities that don't want us or places or environments that don't want us. And then we feel like we've been pushed out because whilst we may have had the strive and the strength to keep going, a lot of people get left behind and fall through that net because they just, they can't deal with a lot of the, a lot of the fact that they don't have any support. So I think, I think that's a really, that's a really important thing that needs to happen is we, we have expect, we have almost accepted the duty and responsibility of building these spaces. So we need to do that. But we also need to do that with our own, with care to ourselves, because that will reflect on how we build the communities and how we communicate that to people. Jasmine, you raised a really important point there about how you ended it, about care for ourselves. Everyone who's on the panel today, um, I think it's that element of in doing this work, whether you frame it as activism, you're changing the narrative, you're reclaiming spaces, it takes its toll physically, mentally, and in other ways. Um, you know, we can be burnt out from it. So it's really important that we draw on our communities in healthy ways to refill our cups. Um, thank you for that. I'm going to go back to Anjana um, to kind of, because we're going to talk, is there anything you want to say on allyship? And Jana, um, and then maybe pull together some of the points from today. Yeah, allyship is really critical to make any of these changes happen, actually, because as we've discussed before, we are not represented on some of the major bodies that are responsible for looking after green spaces, and that those organisations range from Natural England, JNCC, um, and so on and so forth. There are so many different other organisations out there. So when we talk about allyship, it's about putting our voices into spaces where you can make alliances with those people who sit around those tables making those decisions. Um, and that comes through diplomacy and it comes through very careful and powerful strategic thinking and influencing and negotiating and this is what I do all the time all the time it is utterly exhausting but it's really important because as the panel have said we need to change the system so that those who are coming up and waiting in the wings don't have to go through what we are going through now and I would I would hate to think that my daughter as she's growing up has to endure some of the things that I've had to see and experience in my 20 25 year career working in the natural heritage sector if she chooses to go into that so allyship is about building connections alliances through diplomacy um, with the people who do currently seat at those have a seat at those tables and I think we can be in a position of power where we can create our own table and we can co collectively influence um, and negotiate with those organizations that are currently caretakers of nature and landscapes um, but allyship it, it kind of works both ways for us and for, for those organizations that are looking for our expertise. We need, to be, we need to be respected, we need to be valued. Our time is absolutely critical. Um, your point taken that actually we give, a, you know, I never give my time away for free. So please don't ask me. <laughs> um, and I think that we need to take greater ownership and pride in the expertise that we offer quite often a lot of us sit in this area of imposter syndrome and we need to pull ourselves out of that because we are experts in our own right regardless of whether you have a degree in geology marine biology or whatever it is you are an expert in your own right because your lived experience matters just as much as somebody who does have those qualifications so for me allyship is about 
this careful, you know, careful building of relationships built on diplomacy, trust, but equitable equi opportunity and voice. Thank you so much, Anjana. I'm now going to put the spotlight on Jasmine. Got her hand raised. Um, yeah, thank you so much for again for saying that Anjana but also all the other work that you do and there's like there's a lot of thanks that I have to give to you for for this um for everything but I think what I'm gonna almost talk about is just that point about um imposter syndrome and about valuing your own work and your own self um I think that comes from a self-confidence and a self-respect that the reason we don't see a lot of in our communities is because we are almost made to be either the best or the worst and there's no in between there's no time or space for us to be less than the best and there's no because what we see even if we get any representation is someone who has strived and strived so hard to be the best in a system that requires you as a minority to be the best to even be offered the same opportunities as someone else who frankly doesn't have the experience or qualifications that you do, but has simply been awarded that because of the privileges and accessibility that they have had due to perhaps their race, perhaps their gender, perhaps their their you know their their um, their family, whatever it may be. The system has afforded certain people um, a privilege, and so you have to work very hard. So we see the representation as excellence and we cannot reach that. And so we don't have respect for who we are and our own lived experience without qualifications that are given to us for it by people who don't understand our experience. So I think a real way of helping us through this is for us to offer everyone this opportunity to talk about their lived experience, whatever their qualifications be in our own communities because we have that opportunity now. When we reach these spaces where we can actually build our own environments and our own work workplaces and our conferences like this one, we give everyone the chance to speak about their experience. And then we undermine the fact of education being a currency. And we instead, we, we instead um, I think, treasure and greater understand the need for lived experience and for our community to understand that it has its own magic just because of who we are and we we understand that who we are is treasured and is and is a privilege almost so we flip the narrative and we flip that perspective and so i think again that that journey to getting people to not have imposter syndrome and to have respect for themselves and their own work comes through providing spaces for everyone to learn whatever their qualification be and for people, whatever their backgrounds are, to allow themselves to understand that they not only have a place in this nature arena, but they are they are people who should be valued. That's really helpful and inspiring, Jasmine. Um, thank you so much. I'm now going to shine the spotlight on Mohammed. Yeah, we just following up some of the points made and particularly around um, engagement. And I think a lot of organizations are scared of engaging with the communities, particularly grassroots communities, and or, or they want to do it in their time. So it's like we will engage with them nine to five on that, on, on the organization's turf or the sexist turf. And I think sometimes the organizations needs to go to the community and talk with them. And I think we talked about trust early on, and you mentioned trust. And I think trust is built up over time and having relationships. And with many organizations, one of the things that commonly happens is somebody goes there, talks to a group, community group, or whoever they want to talk to. They promise a whole lot of things and come away and never go back again. And, and the next time somebody goes from that organization, it's no wonder they don't want to engage because you came six months ago, a year ago, and what have you delivered? Nothing. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes that organizations make. They don't invest in that engagement and engagement on the community's turf. So actually go to those cities, 
and towns and meet them in the in the gurdwaras, in the mandirs, in the mosques, in the in the community centres, in the parks where they're playing cricket or football or wherever else, and actually engage with them at their level rather than thinking, oh, they have to come to us to engage with the landscapes. Landscapes are there in in the in the cities as well if you find them, engage with them there, and I think. This is where a lot of and, and a lot of organisations go for the easy option of going for somebody who think, well, right, we'll talk to them and that's it, rather than thinking actually let's get, because that's where you're going to make a difference. And if you can get them on board, you will then spread that word across the communities. And I think that's one thing that a lot of organisations need to really consider, and landscape bodies need to consider, and, and governing bodies and whoever you want to talk about, because otherwise it's just a, a cycle of repeated same repeated thing and not, not getting anywhere and unless you you invest in that it's not going to happen and that needs to be i think core part of the organization's budget and work not sort of a, oh we'll do it when we get the money and that's always a case we'll do it when we get the money or we'll apply for some funding and why don't you partner with us well that's not going to work it's got to be sustained and mainstream thank you Mohammed, you raised some really important points again about trust um, those promises that are made. I've been working over the last three years with Anjana and Open University geologists as part of reading the landscapes work. And I had to have some quite uncomfortable, honest conversations at the start of that work about trust, not making fake promises um, and actually following through. And I want to give a bit of a shout out, actually, to somebody who's going to be speaking on day two, Professor Claire Warren from the Open University, who has worked with Gardima CIC as a grassroots, small grassroots community enterprise, and actually followed through. So she's made promises to the group and followed through beyond the remit of the paid project. And she's continuing. She's now an ambassador for the group and she's supporting outside of that financial remit as well. Um, so you raise some really important points. And the time one, not working nine to five weekdays, actually the community grassroots groups are working all sorts of hours, as I see when I look on Abia's page, and often weekends. For me, it's Sundays. You know, our, our work is not nine to five, Monday to Friday. And, you know, Abia raises this. Um, in her talk as well. So thank, thank you for that. I'm now going to hand to Anjana to pull together because in, on day two, we're going to ask other people to kind of respond to today and some of the points you've raised. So Anjana is now going to pull together some of the key messages from today. Oh, thank you so much. I was trying to get a figure out that I've just recently developed for a project that I've just completed with Wessex Museums, but it's it's a little bit tricky to get it get it going. I think what this does, if I'm allowed to share it, let's just see if I can share it. I think what what it will do is it will kind of um, capitalise on on all of the different conversations that have been happening. Let me just grab it for you. Right. Sorry, I've, I'm on two screens, so I just need to do a little bit of switching around. There we go. Ah, uh, yeah. Screen one. That's the one. Okay. So the notes I've made from today kind of essentially encompass this, this model that I've developed for Wessex Museums as a, as a result of two years of working um, and co-creating projects with communities. So this is hot off the press and this is going to the National Lottery Heritage Fund that's funded our work. What we've talked about today is that the sector needs to be brave, it needs to embrace change. And I don't know who's left in the audience, whether we have anybody from any funding bodies, whether we have anybody from organisations that, that manage natural spaces or, or community spaces, but your organisations need to, need to relinquish control of what you do, because in order to work equitably with those who are marginalised from natural spaces, um, you need to relinquish control. And in this diagram, you can see that I'm talking about museums, but, but just ignore that for the moment. Once you relinquish control, you are working in equity with the communities that, that you would like to, to welcome into your spaces. And part of relinquishing control is building empathy with the needs of those audiences, 
and it's also about building a, a relationship of trust. And Mohammed touched on this. It takes a very long time to build a relationship of trust. And in the case of Dudley Miles in the OU, the Open University, I think that relationship has taken, you know, a, a fair, a fair, fairly long time. And we're talking about a year, maybe two years even. So trust is earned, but trust takes time. Once you're able to to kind of begin that journey, don't just talk about it. You can put as many policies as you want into place, but once you have built that trust, once you have done the work internally within the organization so that your staff and your volunteers and your colleagues feel confident that, that they're able to go out to those communities, because believe you me, when I began to work with our museum colleagues, they were really terrified. They were really nervous about saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. So you as organizations need to invest in good training and challenging training that prepares your organization to step into that space of equity with communities. And then you're moving into a space where you're fully co-producing with those organizations, where you're relinquishing control, where you're handing over funding. And we heard from Quezia today, look at all of the amazing things she would like to do. Um, within the arts and cultural heritage sector, I believe that that particular sector is I mean, I would say a decade ahead of where the natural heritage sector is. In museums and galleries, we are enabling young people to take a lead in what they do in those spaces. We hand over funding. We hand over control of the museums. If you follow Kids in Museums, you'll see that every year museums run Kids, kids, uh, kids in Museums Takeover Day, where young people are given a budget and they are given an opportunity to control what happens in the museum for a day. Why can we not do that in natural spaces? So there are there are plenty of ideas out there you can borrow from different spaces to make things happen. And I think as communities, if we look at the right hand side of that diagram, um, I'm, I'm assuming you can see the diagram. Hopefully Gita will say yes, you can. Um, and yes, if we look we at the can. right hand, thank you. If we look at the right hand side of the diagram, our communities need to be proud of the skills that we have. We need to be proud of the knowledge that we hold. And I think where we are respected in an equitable relationship with those organizations that at the moment hold the power, hold the budgets, manage the landscapes uh, until we are in those places as well, until we have our own table where we are directing and projecting our voice into those spaces. We need to be proud of who we are and take confidence in our expertise um, because we have immense value. We have ancestral wisdom we have ancestral knowledge we have we have a different type of relationship with our elders and I think I think lots of people um, will be able to relate to that we have a very very different relationship to our elders um, than than the, than many of the communities in the global north so we need to be proud of those relationships so once once we can build this relationship of equity we will see that change manifest itself but we need both parties to be able to talk to each other diplomatically, equitably, and with trust and with empathy. And I think that that is a very good model, I think, personally, that we can move forward into a space where we are operating and, and beginning to decolonize these natural spaces. I hope that's helpful. Very helpful. I've got Juliana saying very, very um, thank you, Anjana. So that model, I'm sure, will be used um, once it's out there properly. So what a privilege to access that model today. I'm going to shine a spotlight now on Mohammed because he has um, his hand up. Sorry, that's a legacy hand. <laughs> After three years. Oh, it's a oh, it's an old hand. No worries. It's back to Anjana then to talk about synthesizing the day. Really, anything I, that's really what jump what's jumping out to you? I've just made some notes. I'm just going to bring them back. Although I'm going to get rid of that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me just make. I think I think there are a couple of things that have jumped out for me today, and one is is taking pride in who we are and the stories that we hold and our wisdom, that we are experts in our own right. Whatever your age, whatever your background, 
and I think we've we've touched on that word imposter syndrome and I suffer from it all the time I know you don't believe me but I do but we need to really support each other because we are not imposters in these spaces we hold immense knowledge and experience that the wider sector benefits from and at the moment much of that is for free or they're asking for it for free so hold value in that um I also think that we have particularly some of us who are more advanced in our careers we have a very big role to play in coaching and mentoring early career talent young people like Quezia, like jasmine we have a very big role to play in nurturing that talent to come forward because i don't know about you but at some point i'm going to be really exhausted and need to retire in about 20 years <laughs> and i would like to know that there is a generation of young people coming in to kind of take the baton over from me especially so it's it's that mentoring and coaching of early career talent that reflect us at the moment even though we are very very few through our work and through being role models we need to nurture and and support that talent and i mean some of my other notes go back into oh, this was lovely what maxwell said valuing human diversity along with that of nature and i think that's where i'd like to finish really i thought that was an incredibly powerful statement human diversity alongside biodiversity alongside geodiversity and i think where the model that i propose all of the discussions today which have been so marvelous this is where we need to be we need to value the diversity of people thank you so much Joanna, that was lovely. And when I do my thank yous at the end, I'll come back to you. I'm going to shine the spotlight now on Jasmine. Um, I don't know why I keep um, going after Anjana because it's really hard to follow. But um, I, I just really, I think I resonated with the point that was made um, that ties everything up about the diversity of people and the diversity of nature. And I really want to almost shine a spotlight on the diversity of um, how we talk about what we love and how that can really help us with reaching different communities um, and making people and allowing people to understand their own love of nature. So one of the things I've recently started to do is to write poetry um, again, um, because I'd, I'd been doing it for very many years, but I'd never really read it out loud and I'd never really used it as a way of understanding my own relationship with natural history. And from this, I've understood so much about creative writing, about art and about how there are so many different people from different communities who won't necessarily have a scientific understanding of the natural world, but an artistic and a cultural and traditional understanding of it. And the diversity of humanity is about understanding those that that diversity and that wealth of experience and visions from different perspectives um and yeah i just i think that that is a key way that we can reach different communities and a key way we can allow people to be more connected to our world is by understanding where they are in terms of what they're what they love and where they're in what they're interested in and coming from their um corner of the of the arena. Thank you so much, um, Jasmine, for those really important points that you've raised there. Um, come back to us. So I think we're going to start pulling it to an end now. Um, we've really, really enjoyed some of the conversations today, or all of them. Some of them have been challenging, maybe hard to swallow for some people in the audience. And um, they've been bold, they've been courageous, but extremely professional um, in the way that they've been shared. Um, the panelists have deep embedded lived experiences and the way that Juliana and myself have pulled together this panel has not been easy. Someone messaged me yesterday and said, how did you manage to pull together this panel of speakers? Because I don't think they'd have said yes to me. I think that raises an important point about trust. Um, and people will often, sometimes if I get requests, like coming back to Mohammed's point about, will you come on our funding bid? Um, and I'm learning to say no more because 
You can smell genuinity. You know when the work is deep, embedded, and it's going to leave a sustainable legacy. So we make choices built on trust. Um, I haven't met everybody on the panel face to face, but I have seen through the work they've done, through the communities they've worked with, who have spoken about their work, that it's genuine, it's impactful, and it's meaningful. So thank you, first of all, for the panelists, because a lot of them are freelance. So actually taking a day out of their lived jobs of consultancy, or a day out of their writing, or running their charitable work, is a tall order. And at this moment in time, coming up towards Easter, people are also very, very exhausted as well. Um, we do not take it for granted. Yes, we don't take that for granted. And the seminar we've, we've put on is part of, we won't, we're embarrassed to say, it's part of a very small seed corn funding from Brunel. And if we had more money, we'd love to pay the panelists um, what they're worth in their hourly rates for all the time they spent in planning. But we hope we can support the panelists to make an impact by sharing some of the highlights of today through our ebook, which we hope people in institutions will share. And hopefully, people in institutions will come forward to genuinely work with you. And I don't want to say give you a seat at the table because we know what the discourse is around that, um, the deficit model about where being given a seat. And, and Jana has just said so eloquently about, she said, we need to be proud of the knowledge we hold and who we are, the expertise we hold and our different relationships. Whether that, so our relationships with nature, our relationships with elders, our relationship with the water, with green spaces, whatever it is. So, and that's why we started the conference through the success lens. Now, just to kind of start to pull together for day two and the next steps, we would love the panelists to attend day two in May. We have got a different panel of speakers on day two to include someone that Anjana and I have worked with as part of the Open University. Professor Claire Warren. She's one of our speakers for day two. She's going to be talking about what does white allyship mean with work in this space. Um, we've got Professor Gert Randawa. So I'm just giving you a quick insight into two of the day two panelists. And Gert will bring a very exciting and bold lens to day two through some of the work and approach that he's taking with Natural Forestry England. Um, and it's a simple, but it's a really bold approach that he's taking, which I think is going to make a huge difference. Um, we will e be emailing as well for some feedback and we'll be sharing highlights of this conference as well. So to finish, we'd like to say a huge thank you, first of all, to Injana. It takes a lot of preparation to put the keynote together. And um, Juliana and I were saying, and Michelle, that it's one of the best keynotes that we've heard and we're having a lot of we're receiving a lot of texts from colleagues at Brunel and Jana saying who is this person isn't she amazing um wonderful we're hearing some had some beautiful beautifully empowering comments about the speakers that we could just listen to them each all day sadly Adia we couldn't listen to your voice but hopefully on day two um we will have you in this space again and thank you to the tech team behind the scenes who have helped support us put this on. And we would love to, um, we would absolutely love to have had this face to face, but sadly we couldn't um, for cost reasons, etc. We're going to have two books coming out of this conference, one from Anjana and one from Jasmine. So really exciting to have two books that are going to be coming out from panelists and hopefully more by others as well. Do tweet, do share um, some of the comments, some of the key reflections from today, please, using our hashtags and tagging the panelists as well. Um, a lot of the people who are panelists rely on um, other people supporting and amplifying and putting a spotlight on their work because their work is often not 
amplified through mainstream discourses um, or channels as well. Um, Juliana, is there anything you want to say? Um, no, no, I think my voice is now quite <laughs> feeling quite strained. So um, um, thank you everyone for, we do, we do not take it for granted talking to the panelists for you. Um, you um, decided to be with us today, so we are very, very grateful. We we we, are, we feel very privileged um, the, the trust you've given us, and also um, taking the time to, to to share your stories with us. So thank you so much. I've learned so much today. My head is about to explode yeah. with ideas and inspiration. Uh, and I'm just going to finish now because my voice is feeling oh, very strange, <laughs> but. Uh, I look forward to day two. Yeah, so I'm really excited. And Adia, as well, your work is so niche. There is definitely a book in what you're doing as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know you can't respond to that, but there is a book in there as well. Um, well, have a lovely evening. And I hope that all of you manage to have some downtime over the Easter break and you're not working all Easter. I know that many of you will be but I hope you manage to find some quiet time just to be in nature in whatever way you want to be. With lots of love um, from Brunel University and from everybody here. And thank you to everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.